Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Comcare's Transport Network Forum. Uh, I'm Andrew Crane. I'm the Assistant Director of Comcare's uh, Engagement and Design team, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really pleased to be your MC for today's event. We hold these forums twice a year, and the last one was earlier this year in May, so a really warm welcome for those of you joining us for the first time, and for those who previously attended these forums, welcome back, and thanks for your ongoing input and support. I've got to say I'm really looking forward to today's program, which builds on those valuable insights and learnings from uh, that last forum, uh, and share the really exciting program that we've got lined up for you today. Before we do get going, I'd really like to acknowledge traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all virtually meeting today. I'm speaking from Canberra, so I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people who are traditional custodians of this land that I'm on and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I acknowledge the contribution that they make to this nation. I extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians and Torres Strait Islander people who are present. I also want to acknowledge the richness and diversity around the room. Today, we welcome representatives from a broad range of organisations in the transport and logistics industry, defence and other regulators. We've got research, academics, not-for-profits and other organisations. So please let us know in the chat function where you're dialing in from today. Because we acknowledge everyone here brings a different and a valuable perspective uh, and they'll bring insights to the conversation that we're having. So we want to make this sure that this session is as interactive as we can in this virtual environment. So we really welcome you to engage and share your thoughts and generally interact with each other uh, through the chat function. Uh, we ask, of course, that the comments in the chat remain respectful and relevant to the forum. Today's forum is being recorded and the recording will only be picking up our, on our presenters and the slides that are being shown on screen. So you might notice that your microphone and camera are not able to be turned on. For accessibility, the recording will also include the option of closed captions, which we're hoping to make the recording available through Comcare's website in the next week. So throughout the session, we'll be talking about topics that relate to work health and safety, psychosocial hazards, and there'll be aspects of mental health. The panel at the end of the uh, forum will also involve panellists sharing real life experiences and these conversations can sometimes be sensitive in nature or may trigger emotions for some. So there's some supports on the screen uh, now that are available to you if you need it uh, and we'll also post those in the chat. So we've got a great program as I mentioned loaded up for you today and ready to roll out the door. To tell you all about it and officially get us on the road, we've got Justin Napier, General Manager and Number One Driver of Comcare's Regulatory Operations Group. So start up the engine and get us going. Justin, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Well, that's enough bad jokes for today, but uh, I suspect that uh, there'll be plenty more to come. Uh, great to have everyone with us today. Um, fantastic to see so many people and the numbers attending these sessions growing over time. So Justin Nape is my name, General Manager of the Regulatory Operations Group at Comcare. I'm joining you from Melbourne today and would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations who are the traditional custodians of the lands I'm on and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Great pleasure to welcome you to the second of our Transport Network Forums for 2023. Thank you to those of you who have joined us and a big welcome to those joining for the first time. So today's forum takes place during National Safe Work Month. National Safe Work Month is held annually in October and aims to raise awareness and enable discussion about safety at work. This initiative is driven by Safe Work Australia and supported by work health and safety regulators and jurisdictions across the country, including Comcare. The theme for this year's Safe Work Month is for everyone's safety, work safely. This encourages us to prioritise safety in our workplaces and work towards reducing the number of work-related illnesses and fatalities. Comcare has a series of activities for Safe Work Month that are centred around weekly themes. Last week, we held our very first Psychosocial Health and Safety Forum on World Mental Health Day, and this was attended by over 900 participants and received very, very positive feedback. So the recording of this forum is available on our website now. And Comcare's next Safe Work Month webinar is on the 26th of October with a focus on body stressing, musculoskeletal disorder, and good work design. 
So we encourage you to register for those events if you're interested. Our last transport forum was in May this year when we heard from a range of industry experts talking about psychosocial risk, organisational initiatives and safety in design. There was a panel discussion focused on lessons learned from managing and responding to crises with the aim of improving work health and safety in the road transport industry. The May forum was attended by more than 100 participants and received some very positive feedback. And the recording of that event is available on Comcare's website if you missed it and are keen to have another look. We continually receive strong positive feedback from participants. And this has been measured by the post event survey and indicates that the content and delivery of information through these forums is really well targeted. So please do take the time today to complete the short evaluation survey at the end of this session as your feedback really helps us shape the content and direction of future forums. I'd also like to pass on my thanks to the working group that comes together to bring these forums to fruition. A personal thank you to Rod Moore from Australia Post, Simon Skaslick from KNS, Chris Wilkes and Trevor Hayes from Lynn Fox, plus Dave Whitfield and Mel DeMauro from DHL, Anson Ho from Ron Finneymore and Melissa Weller from Healthy Heads. We continue to rely on the working group to guide the content and format of these forums. I encourage anyone who's interested in joining this group to contact us. I understand that there's already a bank of evolving topics that are ready to be considered for future forums. The working group operates on a rotating basis, so we do welcome representatives from transport and logistics organisations to reach out if you'd like to be part of a future session. Now, a key part of Comcare's role is to engage in, promote and coordinate the sharing of information to achieve healthy and safe workplaces. It is in this context that Comcare facilitates the forum to provide a platform for industry representatives and experts to learn from each other's experiences, to promote better practice and better understand and respond to health and safety issues that impact your workplaces. Now, just to note that any references made to the Commonwealth WHS framework applies to just Comcare's WHS jurisdiction. So I know we've got people from perhaps outside Comcare's jurisdiction, most welcome to be here today, but you may need to check on the Safe Work Australia website or with your local or state, territory, state or territory WHS regulator for more information that might be relevant to your organisation and your jurisdiction. Let me recognise the importance of the hard work and commitment that you do as an industry to keep the wheels of the country and the economy turning. This is particularly relevant as we lead up to the busy Christmas period. And we've all seen the signs on the back of the trucks that read, without trucks, Australia stops. A simple but true reminder of the importance of the transport and logistics industry to this country. I'm excited to say a few words about today's agenda. So first up, we have Jerome Carslake from Monash University's Accident Research Centre. Jerome is going to talk about a project he's involved with, which is designed to investigate and understand the scope of fatalities in the road transport industry, especially a focus on suicide prevention. We will then hear from Bronwyn Otto from La Trobe University. Bronwyn will explore whether addressing psychosocial hazards can help prevent both musculoskeletal and mental health disorders. Both are significant WHS challenges in the road transport industry, as well as more broadly across Comcare's jurisdiction and the community as a whole. This presentation will provide an overview of a systems thinking study, including development and evaluation of training packages for supervisors, managers and WHS professionals working in the road transport industry. We are then fortunate to have a case study prevented by Chris Wilkes from Lynn Fox. I understand this is founded on a presentation of Lynn Fox's 4Ds initiative, which brings together, which approaches the issue of safety from uh, the premise that being safer starts with asking better questions. This initiative has been introduced by Lynn Fox as a simple way to capture work activities and practices that team members believe are done, difficult, different, or dangerous in relation to their work. 
we really appreciate Lynn Fox's generosity in sharing these experiences. Following this, there will be a panel session around respect at work, discussing prevention of sexual harassment and promotion of psychosocial safety in workplaces. I would like to thank Holly Conroy and Casey Horsnell for their courage in sharing their lived experiences within the transport industry, as well as Rod Moore from Australia Post, who was key to supporting and enabling this session. It's no surprise that most of you attending today's forum work within road transport organisations. However, also in our audience today, we do have attendees from other WHS regulators, academics, local councils, frontline and senior managers, health and safety representatives, and a few from outside the industry looking for ideas or inspiration that you can use to improve your work health and safety practices. Welcome to all of you, and it's great that you could be with us for today's event. I hope that today provides some practical insights and takeaways for you that will enable you to better respond to the challenges presented in your workplaces. Wherever you work, and whatever you do, I hope you take something positive away that you can apply in your workplace to improve health and safety outcomes. And finally, just a big thank you to my colleagues from Comcare's education and engagement team for their hard work in making this forum and all the other forums that Comcare runs for making this one happen. Their work is predominantly behind the scenes, but without them, initiatives such as this would not happen. So thank you everyone for joining us today and please enjoy today's session. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Justin. And so on. Uh, a bit more about today's forum. So when we developed the agenda for today's forum, we considered your feedback from the last session in May uh, that was uh, put in during both the live chat and the post event survey. We polled participants on what topics you would like to see more of at the forums. And some of the responses included uh, mental health, uh, prevention and early intervention, psychosocial risk management, uh, and new safety systems and initiatives. So to give us some insight into the approaches underway in the industry, participants indicated that they want more case studies to hear about the latest research and how that research is being applied, to learn from what others are doing and to see what can be adapted in their own workplace. So first off in the program, as Justin mentioned, we've got Jerome Carslake. A bit about Jerome. Jerome's the director of the National Road Safety Partnership Program which delivered in partnership through Monash University's Accident Research Centre. Jerome's got extensive knowledge in workplace uh, road safety management. It's a program that, and the program delivery and the collaborative development of solutions. Jerome's the chair of the Construction, Logistics and Community Safety Australia, the steering group, and he'll lead and provide the project management of this proposed project which we'll be talking about. Uh, other related pro collaborative projects include the Heavy Vehicle Toolbox Talk and Suicide in Road Transport Prevention. He's got a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and a Master's in Agribusiness. So Jerome's going to deliver a session on Osroad's Suicide Prevention Program Project with a focus on suicide prevention in the road transport industry. Welcome, Jerome. Excellent. So I'll dive on in. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, I guess, to go through this project, um, it's one of those things which has been quite transformational and quite a journey that I'm sort of going on. Um, it's been a major piece of work, but just a bit of a map out of what I'm going through. I'm going to compress a lot of content into probably just about sort of 18, 20 minutes. Um, and this is sort of the agenda I'm going to walk you through today. Um, and just really drawing and reaffirming what Andrew said earlier, I am going to be touching on some tough, tough elements which relate to suicide. Um, I'm not sure what you've been through in your life or what your situation is at the moment um, or what's sort of going on. Um, and I think one of the key things to think about is at the end of today's session, um, with some things that we discuss in a positive sort of way, I hope, that you just take the chance to take some time to go outside, celebrate life, go for a walk, um, hug someone and reflect on the positivities of, of everything at the moment as well and, and just do a bit of self-care. And if, it is, if anything is triggered, Please step away, turn it off, um, and just reach out to someone for some help. And um, just drawing in some other support services as well, which is one of the key things we really need to make sure that everyone can draw on. Um, these are all the, the range of support services which align with what this project's been sort of looking at in particular. Um, so please feel free to reach out to them. 
Now, what I want to just touch on is some sort of key facts because suicide pops up a lot. Um, a lot of people sort of can draw on and say, look, it, it's a big surge. Things are sort of popping up all over the place and it's moving forward. But um, this is really what sort of informed our sort of project at the time. Uh, you can sort of see it's reasonably sort of constant over the sort of the, the sort of period, 3,000 moving back and forth. Um, unfortunately, males, uh, we're not we're higher risk of being involved in suicide than females. The other thing is, is uh, females at sort of a lower sort of portion. But really, when you're sort of drawing into it, um, those who have a sort of, I guess, a suicide risk usually have a number of other sort of risk factors, which are sort of drawing them towards that sort of um, that sort of component um, and, and, making, and, and making a suicide decision. And those sort of things can be like mood disorders, depression, um, suicide ideation, problems in spouse, spousal relationships, um, alcohol intoxication, um, personal history of self-harm, and also our Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders can also have a higher um, uh, suicide risk as well. <clears throat> I guess the key thing here, what we're sort of touching on, on the ripple effects, and this is where I guess transport is quite a little bit different to a lot of areas, and this is sort of an emerging area, is that um, when a suicide event takes place, it touches on a lot of other lives and other sort of people, and it's far larger than just that little group that's impacted. Um, and at the current moment, data and suicides involved on the road transport system is not recorded or publicised anywhere whatsoever, which makes it a lot harder for the sector in particular um, to recognise the impact that it has on their drivers, but also first responders and those sort of groups as well. Um, next slide, please, which should be Origins. Yes. Okay. Um, so really the origins of this project is, so the NRCP is governed by a steering group. Um, on that is Toll, uh, and one, at one of our steering committee meetings, Toll delved into and was looking at a whole lot of work around in relation to 26C in the China Responsibility Legislation. And they del delved back into a decade's worth of data, which was overseen by um, um, Sarah Jones. And if you want to deep dive into it, uh, there's the Lessons Learned website. That's a webinar that we have on our website, and you can really dive into, really understand the why. Um, next slide, please. Um, origins so, insights from the toll data we've got great um so on that what was really quite fascinating is that that sort of popped up in there what didn't pop up in there was i guess a lot of people would expect maybe those what they didn't find to be the key sort of things but when they began diving into the data and if you look at 147 arising from fatalities for 127 instances the moment they actually looked at towards i guess a um uh, are cleaned up going towards the suicide component, the number of instances would actually disappear, be reduced as a result of how the data is uh, treated within our current sort of system. Um, next slide, so insights for toll data. So in there, the fourth finding was probably one of the key sort of elements on that. And amongst all that, that decade's worth of fatalities, unfortunately, um, was a number of, of third party suicides on their trucks. And as a result of that, as an organisation, what can you actually do to reduce that sort of risk? And there's, there's very little. The only way they can do it is probably by a shared responsibility, working with a lot of other organisations. And that's where they sort of reached out to the program um, through our sort of steering group and those sort of organisations to say, well, what can we actually do to take this forward? Uh, next slide, please, which is the origins. And if you look at this around the, the makeup in particular, around the 14%, um, of that, there was like 63% of pedestrians, vehicles, and motorcyclists. And the key thing is, is you have to understand it's certainly an underestimate because the way it works within the suicide in the system is, is basically um, the coroners will always err on the point of view of making a decision with regards to is it a suicide from basically the uh, um, the stigma that comes with it. So they'll sort of err on that sort of component um, and keep it out. And as a result, that's why it's probably a higher element because at the moment we don't capture the data so we don't actually know the scale of it within the, within australia even in the transport there's people people driving by themselves and what's really powerful is camaraderie where they can reach out to each other and that snippet that we have on our website shows um of um cars from cube and it just really draws on it so if we go to the next slide which is around the toolbox talk packs and i'm just trying to put this in the show instead of just saying look here's the negativity here's the problem Here's some elements and no healthy heads is part of this other sort of components, but these are sort of toolbox talks you can engage your drivers and draw on really to make them for a conversation um, and move them all forward. Um, if we just go to the next one on the uh, the journey slide, please. Um, this slide really just maps out the complexities and the length and the size of this sort of project. So you can sort of see how it kicked off with, I guess, the lessons learned and from the insights from tool, from um, from Toll Group. But the way I guess the NSRP approaches is that we take a very collaborative, inclusive area and we don't try and recreate the wheel. 
Um, so in exploring it around, uh, we looked at internationally as well, and that's where the UK has a whole lot of work. They just really commenced basically 18 months prior. And really Australia, um, UK and Sweden are the only real countries that are really beginning to explore this sort of risk to the sector. Uh, and you'll see why that's really important that we actually should be talking about it, but doing it in a safe way to really understand the sort of problem. So the pipeline of the whole project was moving, moving along um, as we went through. We did a scoping at the start. Um, we involved a number of sort of partners from real life experiences and the coroners came along and were really involved, um, scoped it all out. And that's what that's led to this larger sort of project moving forward now, um, which nearly had like 130 um, people, organisations providing input into it as we move forward. Um, next slide, please, on the project structure. Now, for this, it just sort of illustrates the complexities and diversity of all the organisations involved in it. And quite often, a lot of projects, when you approach it, comms and language goes right to the back end and it's sort of like an afterthought. But in this sort of project, it was very much front of mind, how are we going to sit there and talk about this in a safe way? And anything to do uh, with suicide uh, prevention and those sort of elements, we need to be think very, very carefully how we're going to talk about it. Because um, there's sort of been a long debate about the within the public about mass communications and suicide, and does it lead to a spike in suicide, suicidal behaviour, um, which is known as the Werther sort of effect. Uh, but what we've sort of discovered over time is, is there is a way to talk about it, and we should be talking about it in a safe way. So we can sort of de destigmatise it and bring people forward and, and move along those. And that's sort of known as the uh, Papageno effect, as an example, um, which is named up sort of Mozart's opera called The Magic Flute which is all around when people in suicide crisis sort of areas, it's around showing alternative ways to solve the problems um, and how we sort of step it all up and, and bring people together. Um, and that's where all these different areas on, on if we, are you okay, the checking in, that's like going back to cuz and just taking that moment to, to check in with a mate, to draw people behind and, and pull over for a cup of coffee. And it shows anyone can do it and you can sort of do that. Um, next, we had a sort of data, which was led by Griffith University, and they looked after also the uh, the interventions, trying to explore what's in place. And this is really a broader sort of scan. And the other part we have is a, like a research tier at the end, looking at third parties, um, barriers to interventions, and then also looking at a, a, um, a National Health and Medical Research Council project on interventions in public spaces. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we also touched on, I guess, talking to Sweden and the National Highways um, project as well. So not trying to do things alone and to recreate the wheel when we're sort of moving forward. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when sort of Toll reached out through the through the NRCP, it was really sort of talking about, well, we can't do this alone. And, and that's the truth on all this. Um, when we sort of look into the, uh, the National Road Safety Strategy Action Plan, those sort of areas, it's based around what we call the social model now, um, which underpins the safe system, which sort of recognise that people make mistakes. But the issue here, um, I guess in the in regards to suicide and road transport system is this is where the model sort of breaks down in some sense because people are deliberately making mistakes and choosing um, the mechanism as, for road transport system um, to take their lives and and the chances is they can sort of hide it in that sort of sense. But then if you look at the black dog and you sort of begin talking about it and, and that's where we're sort of looking at um, that social model where the two sort of align quite powerfully, we can interact them together. And once again, we also sort of have a role to play. Um, and just checking in, um, providing avenues, recognising resources, those sort of components. But it's also not the job of an individual, but to sort of pick them up and sort of direct them to where they can find sort of resources to pick it up um, and to check those sort of balances in, in those areas. And there's plenty of them about. Um, it's just finding the right ones that are fit for purpose. But the whole goal here is, is just make sure that people just aren't feeling alone and organisations aren't as well. Um, and just taking the time to sort of check in. And this is sort of really looking at the social model, which underpins it as we sort of move forward. Now, if we can go into the uh, the next slide, please, around recommendations. As I touched on, probably one of the key things on this um, was really looking at stream one around the language and communications done by uh, Mindframe. And Australia is extremely lucky by having an organisation like that. They are a world leader um, and they're consulted all over the place to try and to create an environment on how to talk about things in a safe way. Um, so there's this really a strong association between public communication about method um, and imitative behaviour, which goes back to that Werther, Werther point and how we talk about it in a safe way. Um, we cannot glorify it or um, talk about sharing details of methods, locations, uh, memorialising those sort of issues as well. Um, we need to avoid connecting prevention activities and stories or individual deaths. Um, and this is where I think in the transport se sector in particular, it's really around humanising um, the drivers within the vehicles, because a lot of people just see the truck 
so there's a massive object instead of sitting there thinking there's a human sitting inside that truck um, and that's where you got to refocus really on the negative impact on others so understanding that to norm's point the lifelong impacts that has had on him and he mentions we had a discussion a bit later on he knows his triggers now um, and he goes to see a psychologist to help when those sort of things going on so understanding those sort of points as you move move forward um, really avoiding the stigmatizing language so we we take away those those and that's like that unfortunately it's like um commit uh those sort of elements and are moving in there and really moving towards the prevention and early intervention and one of the gaps i within the transport sector which it's really sort of emerged is is unlike in rail and and those other ones there's a whole whole element of building the resilience um, for drivers before they're involved or coming across road trauma or a suicide and those things so they're prepared for it they know it's going to happen then when it does happen acting on it and then afterwards what's the part pipeline for recovery and flowing through those areas um and then we, so when we sort of look at the data and the next sort of step um the terms epidemic gets thrown around quite liberally um that there's so many people dying by so this is a big sort of thing it's got to avoid the sensual sensationalizing the language um and alert not alarm and using the real neutral sort of language as we're sort of moving forward and this is where from the data side was making the point that we sort of really need to begin collecting the data um, reporting on it in a safe sort of way as well uh, first starting internally and then we can see where things can go from that sort of point um, and including in, in road trauma reports those sort of elements because if we can destigmatize it the treatment for dealing with some like a suicide area is in quietly entirely different maybe the data is being skewered to the wrong sort of interventions are taking place and unfortunately that a lot of times our truck drivers those sort of people and one of the things in this once you begin looking into some work like this it's incredible how many things began popping up um, the other one is near misreporting uh, can we sort of capture some of those data so people there is, there is actually people begin reporting on and understanding where these near miss events are occurring um if we can go to the next recommendations please on stream three so this is then looking at the intervent interventions around road infrastructure technology as i mentioned earlier just on, on the near miss reporting events but we don't have to sort of recreate the wheel um, as i mentioned rail transport's been lead leading the way there's track safe um, mates in construction and this is where we're lucky that healthy head structure sheds now come along I mean, so we can sort of draw on those sort of interventions to move it all forward and, and actually learn on those sort of good practices approach. And the thing is then if you're actually moving between and you can really support together in those sort of areas. Um, on the research side, which we're just sort of delving into it, is once again, you can sort of see the common threads of how it was flowing through a system, systemic approach and training risk management. Um, and the other thing is just un overcoming the barriers. Uh, so understanding what sort of target groups you need to look at. But the other, other amazing thing is just from a technology front, um, as some of the new um, technology flows into trucks and those sort of components, how they can sort of act ABS, they can step over, they can stop the trucks in time if possible, um, and those sort of areas. And there are some narratives that's been shared with me where basically those, those events occurred and the driver and um, the person that was trying to make the intervention um, did not occur. So the last one is then really public spaces and we're happy to sort of share that uh, as, the, as the research is going through. Um, the last sort of area is around the, the Sweden sort of model. Um, so uh, slide 19. Um, they are quite a long way ahead of us. Um, they recognise they have a vision zero over there, which Australia models itself on and follows very, very closely. Um, what they sort of realised was how can you have vision zero on a road system if you're not actually collecting this data? Um, if people are hiding or other sort of components are going. So they started the classification process um, in 2010. They then actually recognised they had some errors in those sort of components. They tightened that up into 2013. You could see quite a big jump all of a sudden once they actually got a closer definition. But they've been there, they've experienced it. We're talking about a workshop with them in um, late November uh, where we can draw in OSROADS and begin providing the leadership towards government in getting some common threads of measures and reporting on this so it can actually address all of those sort of areas. And those are the, the I guess, the examination processes which Sweden's been using. So. Um, what's exciting is, is on a positive side is that we're going to go ahead and begin doing those sort of elements um, and we can recreate uh, and learn from others and then apply it locally, hopefully with Australia and who knows, we might actually get some common measures in this place across the entire sort of uh, federation. Now, if we can just go to the last slide, potential next steps. As I mentioned, um, uh, we're, we're trying to work out where that body of data, how it should be collected, where the near misses should go. 
Um, I think a resource pack or something around resilience would be a fantastic avenue for the, for the transport sector in particular, um, especially on helping prepare drivers. And it doesn't just have to be the suicide, anything to do with some form of road trauma, because the chances are they will be amongst the first that, that go through it. Over in the UK, National Highways has developed the, the um, I guess, the White Knight project. I know Nat Roads has been talking about it and released it at the recent conference around actually preparing drivers. But then there's what happens when an event takes place as well. Um, and then afterwards, you need to really make sure. And then I touched on the Sweden element um, just uh, prior as well. So um, just acknowledgements, just the, the second last slide, please. Uh, this was, as I mentioned, it's an enormous project. It involved many sort of people uh, feeding into it. It's an Australian sort of first in drawing it together. Uh, and we had a, like a project team, a large working group, and then there was a national working group that moved it all forward. And what was quite exciting, it wasn't really just, I guess, the transport sector. There's other organisations tapping into it that have been impacted. So uh, this is this is the reality of, of this sort of issue. It's, it's not an epidemic, but I think we all share a responsibility for how we're going to support each other. Um, no single organisation can do this alone, but I think we need to sort of be very open and collaborative in how we're going to do it. So um, that's me. I, I Sorry about the technical issues moving moving through all this. I'm not sure what's happened to my teams. I've got a black, black screen in front of me, so um, I hope that was helpful. Yep, uh, and thanks, Jerome. Really appreciate your resilience uh, and adaptability <laughs> uh, responding to the technology. Um, yes, unfortunately, we uh, have had people experience these um, challenges before, even when they're made a presenter. Um, and sometimes it involves uh, logging off and coming back on, but we won't. don't want you to do that, of course. Um, so, um, uh, have we got any questions coming through the audience? Um, we did see a couple of comments, um, certainly kind of around the challenges of uh, managing human behaviours and understanding employees better, uh, having open conversations with all employees before um, shifts. So, yeah, thanks, Celine, for popping that comment through. Um, we've got some positive comments about a great presentation. Um, thanks, Jerome. Um, and and thank you to Melanie for sharing the report. It's a fantastic report. Um, and i got to say, uh, it's awesome leadership by Osroads in taking this on as well. I mean, this is quite, that's quite a transformational step to take. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, thanks again, um, Jerome. Uh, really appreciate uh, you being in there and uh, your adaptability, as I said. Uh, so next up, and fingers crossed, our technology is now going to um, support us. Uh, we've got Bronwyn Otto, who's a PhD candidate and a research assistant at the School of uh, Psychology and Public Health at La Trobe. Uh, Bronwyn's got over 25 years' experience in occupational health and safety. She's worked in a diverse range of industries uh, in operational strategic roles, including uh, at a national and an international level. Bronwyn's a specialist in occupational health and safety, uh, is a physiotherapist. Uh, she's got a Bachelor of Applied Science, a Graduate Certificate in OHS Management, a Master's of Economic uh, Economics, uh, Safety and Health. Uh, so she's well qualified. She's a very passionate advocate for prevention of work-related musculoskeletal and mental health disorders, uh, system thinking and translation of evidence into practice. Uh, Bronwyn's currently doing her PhD through La Trobe um, University. And today, I'm hoping that Bronwyn's going to be able to give us a progress update on a study that's been conducted by researchers from La Trobe and Queensland University uh, of Technology. And the study is about addressing psychosocial hazards in the heavy transport um, industry and in the heavy vehicle transport industry and developing some resources to identify and manage psychosocial hazards. Uh, and particularly with a focus uh, around preventing musculoskeletal and mental health disorders. So if you attended the last Transport Network Forum, you might have had a chance to uh, participate in the study. So uh, over to you, Bronwyn. Uh, hopefully we can get your camera working. It says with an air of hope. Or at least your microphone working. There we are, Bronwyn, we can see you, which is very exciting. Hi. And can and you hear can me hear okay? You. We can Yay. hear you. Now we've just got to get the um, slides to work. Okay, so thanks, Andrew, for the introduction and also to Comcare for inviting me to present today. Um, and also thanks, Jerome. That was an excellent presentation. It was so very interesting um, and a really great segue into my presentation, which is also touching on musculoskeletal disorders. Um, mental health disorders rather, however, coming from a preventative approach. So
So um, good every good afternoon to everyone in the audience as well. And I'd like to start the presentation by asking you all to respond to three questions, um, which I think, um, Africa, are they in the poll or the chat? How can people see those questions? They are just popping up in a poll right now. Wonderful. We so do I'll have just a circle people... of doom scrolling around, but um, we're trusting <laughs> that it's going to go live any second now. So. Okay. I'll just give people time to um, fill out the responses. So there's three questions. One is just what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about mental health? What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about musculoskeletal disorders? And is the following statement true or false? Hazardous manual tasks affect musculoskeletal disorder risk much more than psychosocial hazards do. And um, I'll bring up the responses to those later on in the presentation. Yes, I think I'm, uh, I have the feeling we might be technically challenged today on that front. So um, it might be the, um, the chat might be uh, the best way to go until we've got, uh, got them working. Okay, so will Irvika be able to pop them in the chat for me? Yes, we pop the question in there as well. And we do have some responses, so they, they are coming through. Yeah. So oh, wonderful. Working. Thanks, Irvika. Thank you. All right, now I'll kick on. So the structure of my presentation today, I'm going to discuss the prevalence of musculoskeletal and mental health disorders. I'm going to talk about the current evidence about the development and prevention of these disorders. I'll also give an overview of the gap between the current evidence and what's actually happening out there in workplace practice. And then we'll discuss what's needed to close that gap in workplace practice. I'll give you um, an, an overview of the study, what, what it's about, um, the background or the trigger for leading to the development of that study, and then just a snapshot of some of our early results. Um, and I'll also discuss right at the end there how you might like to get involved in the study. So why focus on musculoskeletal and mental health disorders and why focus on this in the transport industry? So as stated on this slide here by Safe Work Australia, musculoskeletal conditions continue to account for the vast majority of workers' compensation claims for serious injuries. Its prevalence is as high as 87%. However, it's important to note that we know this figure under represents the true extent of the real problem because this figure is actually limited to serious accepted claims and that's the claims that actually result in one week or more time loss for walk from work. So this figure does not include musculoskeletal disorders which are not reported, does not include musculoskeletal disorders for which claim has not been lodged, and it does not include musculoskeletal disorders that have not resulted in more than seven days loss. And finally, it does not include musculoskeletal disorder claims that are declined. Now, regarding psychological injuries, Safe Work Australia states not only are these claims increasing in number and severity, but the time workers lose from work as a result of these disorders are actually almost four times longer than for other injuries. We also know that the road transport sector has been identified as one of six priorities industries which would benefit from reducing the prevalence of injury and illness. Again, looking at prevalence, well, globally, we do know that musculoskeletal and mental health disorders represent an enormous burden to individuals workplaces, the community and society as a whole. And this diagram shows the burden represented in Australia. You can see there by the yellow and the purple that musculoskeletal and mental health disorders represent the highest burden of all of the disease groups within Australia. Now looking at the prevalence of these disorders in the Australian transport sector, 
The graph on the left represents the transport sector and the graph on the right represents all other sectors. From the green there, you can see that within the transport sector, um, musculoskeletal disorders represent 60% of all of the injuries and in other sectors, they're 54%. So actually, the prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders in the transport sector is higher than the combination of all of the musculoskeletal disorders across all other sectors. When we look at mental health conditions, um, they are the yellow, so much smaller than the prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders. Um, but as we spoke about earlier, obviously the time lost um, makes it a significantly expensive condition to manage. Now, in order to understand how to prevent these disorders, it's really useful to first understand how these disorders actually develop. Um, can we see the responses from the um, from the chat or the poll, Irvika? I can't see them, so I'm wondering whether you can sort of call out what sort of themes you're seeing there or Andrew. Um, Andrew might be having some technical difficulties, so <laughs> I'm happy to help. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the first one for the first question, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about mental health? We have depression as a big one, um, well-being, stress and anxiety, good communication, feeling of well-being, people, stigma, empathy, excessive, work pressures. Thank you. That's great. And what about musculoskeletal disorders? So the big one is pain. Then we have taboo, manual handling, sprains and strains, life interrupters, misalignment, strength and conditioning, and better than cure. Great. And for question three, did we have mainly true or false? Oh, it's almost even. So 46% of participants selected true and 53% selected false. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you for that. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, usually when I ask about mental health, we do tend to see a lot of people associated with the negative things like depression and anxiety. So it's really good to see that some people picked up on that. It's actually a state of positive well-being. Um, looking at musculoskeletal, similarly, we do tend to see people associate them with manual handling um, and with sprains and strains. Um, so the thing that is missing there is that musculoskeletal dis disorders also develop from psychosocial hazards. Um, with regard to that third statement being true and false, um, psychosocial hazards um, contribute to the development of musculoskeletal disorders and they're equally as important as the manual handling hazards, if not more important than them. So that's that's a little bit of data that hopefully will be a bit new and a bit surprising that people can perhaps explore um, after this presentation. Um, I think a really good example I can provide that actually comes from one of Jody Oakman's papers um, is if you think about a worker pushing a trolley and let's say that that trolley is is light, it's not like your Woolworths or your Coles calling trolley with uh, those um, terrible wheels on them. It's actually a nice, easy trolley to manoeuvre. From a physical perspective, a lot of people would say, well, that's a low risk. We don't need to worry about that. But if you also consider all of the relevant psychosocial hazards, and you can see some of those listed on the screen there, um, say that worker has got high workloads, um, they've got low levels of say about the way that their job is done. They've got a really high pace of work and really tight time pressures to meet. And they've also got a really unsupportive boss. Um, that activity then becomes actually quite a high risk activity. So I think that's a really good example. 
Um, this is just another slide to reiterate that point that um, musculoskeletal disorders do develop as a result of physical and psychosocial hazards. Um, I think stress resulting from exposure to psychosocial hazards is often viewed as being in somebody's head, but in reality, the stress response actually results in physiological changes including muscle tension and hormone changes, which together result in cumulative tissue damage. And if the exposure is intent and or prolonged, that cumulative tissue damage can be quite severe. Um, similarly, that slide on the right shows um, that this stress re response, when it is prolonged or extreme, um, not only does it again result in those reduced mental health and poor health behaviours, but also psychological injury and physical injury illness, which includes the musculoskeletal disorders. It's also really interesting to note that this um, information about psychosocial hazards contributing to the development of musculoskeletal disorders has been around since the 1990s, um, but here we are um, in the early um, 2000s and um, that evidence continues to still not be applied in workplace practice. So we've still got a lot of work to do in this space. Now, I wanted to share this study with you. Um, it's a really lovely study by Jodie Oakman and colleagues from La Trobe University. Um, and in the study, interviews were conducted with staff from 19 work organisations comprising residential aged care and logistics and transport workers. And Staff were interviewed to understand their beliefs and opinions about risk management of musculoskeletal and mental health disorders. And based on the outcomes of these interviews, a number of barriers were actually identified for effective prevention of these disorders. And some of these included workplace risk management largely failed to identify, assess and control risk from work-related psychosocial hazards. Most of the interviews were unaware that work-related psychosocial hazards affected MSD risk. And the policies and practices for addressing psychosocial factors mainly addressed personal factors such as bullying, harassment and individual stress management, rather than the work and organisational factors for which managers have clear responsibility. So I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about that now. Um, so what is actually needed? What do we need to do in the workplace to reduce musculoskeletal and mental health prevalence? Um, current research um, highlights the need to include workers um, in the hazard identification, risk assessment and risk control process, development of risk control measures to address hazards at the source and also the use of the systems approach. So looking at the use of the systems approach, um, I'm not sure whether many of you have heard of a systems approach or systems thinking, um, but a system actually comprises not only the worker, but the task and equipment and the workplace physical and psychosocial environment in which that work takes place. When we look at hazardous manual handling tasks, if we limit our focus to just task and equipment factors, we're missing all of those other hazards um, in the remainder of the system. So we are missing those hazards that exist in the work organisation and job design factors and also the workplace environment factors. Just moving over to that um, little diagram on the right there, I've got those listed as levels. So at the highest level, we've got government regulators and external influences, then organisation governance and administration, followed by operations management and frontline. So obviously the frontline is the workers where the, where the work happens. Operations management um, is like frontline supervisors. Organisation governments and administration is like um, CEOs and COOs who control the budget and the resourcing. Um, and I don't think the government and regulators need any further explanation. Um, so what happens in systems thinking is that system thinking is based on a theory that complex systems cannot be understood by studying parts in isolation. So that means we don't want to break down the task um, into small snapshots or points in time. We need to actually consider the work um, in its entirety using a more holistic approach. 
In that approach, we need to consider the interaction between parts of the system and the emergence of the behaviour that results from that interaction. Um, and looking at that little um, hierarchical structure on the right there, um, this shows that behaviour is impacted by the decisions and actors of all of the actors across the system, not just the workers. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, Sharon Noonan and Natasia's good paper about Don't Blame the Driver. Um, I think it's a really um, great paper that explains this systems thinking perspective really well. Um, that we do also need to develop controls in the other levels of the system beyond just the front line. I'll now move into, actually, there was one thing I was going to say, which is actually the lead into why we did this study. Um, one of the other barriers in the workplace to preventing effective management of musculoskeletal disorders as well as mental health disorders is this lack of knowledge in particularly supervisors, workplace health and safety professionals and managers. Um, and there was a study completed again by Jody Oakman and colleagues in 2016, which really highlighted a need for improved knowledge and skills in these stakeholders. Um, and a really good example of this was in my master's thesis, we actually did a musculoskeletal um, disorder prevention implementation in a workplace. Um, and even though we actually gave um, the stakeholders involved in the implementation and the managers um, a toolkit to actually use that had procedures, um, resources, guidelines, um, stepped out the whole implementation to follow. One of the key barriers with that implementation were the very strong beliefs and opinions of those stakeholders about how musculoskeletal disorders and mental health disorders develop. Um, and hence we identified, um, along with other research, that we really do need to have some training for these stakeholders to improve their knowledge and skills. So an overview of the study, which I'm really lucky to be working on as part of my PhD, um, it's a multi-pronged study. Um, so phase one, was development of a stamp model, so systems thinking, accident model and processes. Phase two, we did interviews with supervisors, managers and workplace health and safety professionals. Phase three is development of a training package, which is tailored for supervisors, managers and WHS professionals. And four, we're actually delivering the training workshops now. They kicked off yesterday. Um, for supervisors, managers and workplace health and safety professionals. And we're going to evaluate um, the training and obviously re refine it uh, with the hope of being able to offer it outside as well as the transport industry, but also to other industries eventually. Um, but our key hope is to get a lot of feedback from these stakeholders so that we know the training is actually tailored and will be effective for them. Unlike most training, development and evaluation of the training will be based on a systems thinking approach and underpinned by two theoretical frameworks. This is just a snapshot of um, some early results from the study. So looking at the stamp where we actually map the current controls against those levels in the system that I was previously talk about, talking about. Um, so it is a bit busy and a little bit hard to read, but it's just to show you um, the, the current controls that we're seeing at each of those levels. So here we've got parliament and legislation, government departments, etc., external supply chains and providers. And here we've got um, controls at country company management level, frontline management level, and then this is the workers down here with the tactical decision making and environment. And we split down here into physical and psychosocial environment so you can see some of those um, hazards as well as controls that are dealt with there. I think some of the key findings um, at this stage, when we also did a literature review, which is also informing the training, um, there is a definite gap in evidence for real world studies on intervention implementation effectiveness. Um, so there, there's very few studies that are actually looking at effective controls that are, that are done in workplaces to control musculoskeletal and mental health disorders. 
some of the other key findings are the number of actors at the government level here. So we had the government departments, regulators, industry associations, etc. Huge number of um, legislation, guidance, um, policies coming out there and then a number of levels until we actually get down to the tactical level. So the workers who actually need that information, um, one of the one of the findings well, is all of that really good information actually getting to the people who really, ne really need it most. Um, and similarly, is the feedback actually getting back from the worker right up to that level of the system so that um, the regulators um, can actually be doing um, more great things to improve the effectiveness of performance at that level. So um, hopefully I've given you all a really small taste of the really exciting study that we're working on and I would love for um, people to get involved because we really want this training to be um, what the industry needs. So we're really looking forward to getting insights from people. Um, if you would like to participate in an interview, it's still not too late. Um, that is still, because we're still refining the program, um, we would still love to get greater um, input from stakeholders about what the training should look like. Um, so there's a QR code on the left there. And then on the right, I've got a QR code if you would like to um, participate in our free training workshops, which are currently being run. Um, we've got one tomorrow and we've also got one next Wednesday. They're both online. Um, and also, if you would like to sign up for one next year, we're looking at running more. Please also um, register um, at the QR code there. I've just got acknowledgements here. My three supervisors. Um, the project is funded by Safe Work Victoria. And if you would like to find out more about the study, please email me. And I've got my references here, but thank you all very much for listening today. Thanks, Bronwyn. We do have a question that's come through, um, which is around uh, are the training in the workshops in phase four, are they tailored to each of the three groups that you mentioned, or is it a standard presentation? Oh, it's a standard presentation that we're, that we're tailoring to supervisors, managers and workplace health and safety professionals. And they're the groups that we're getting input from to say, um, is this training what you want? Is this at the right level for you guys? Um, what are we missing? Right. I hope that's answered the question. Terrific. I'm just going to try and unshare. So thanks, Bronwyn, for such an interesting presentation and background to the research uh, and the outcomes of that. We've got any other questions coming through the chat? Uh, Tom uh, looks like has made a comment about body stressing being identified as a main cause of harm in our jurisdiction, uh, particularly as um, the transport um, and warehousing, transport postal and warehousing sector um, accounting for the greatest number of those across the Comcare scheme for um, body stressing. So, yeah. Um, interesting that that's correlated and sort of confirmed. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, so thanks again, Bronwyn. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to squeeze this in in amongst your busy schedule and the two present the crew two workshops that you're delivering. Uh, great to know there's still some space. People have got those QR codes, so if you are keen, uh, is that the best way to get on board if they're keen? Yes. Or alternatively, they could just email me. Awesome. No problem. Uh, so Thanks we might so put much, your Andrew. email address in the um, chat there. Uh, if people want to pick that up too. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Good on you. Thank you. So it looks like we now have technology uh, working again for us, uh, which is wonderful to see. Uh, so our next presentation or our next session is going to be presented by uh, Chris, Chris Wilkes from Linfox. And Chris is the group manager for safety, health and wellbeing at Linfox. Uh, before joining Linfox, Chris spent 13 years at West Farms, uh, predominantly in Bunnings business, leading teams in health, safety, security, wellness, injury management, workplace relations and uh, regulatory compliance. So he's got a broad range of experience in both Australia and New Zealand, having worked across a diverse range of industries, which includes retail, logistics, transport, security, manufacturing and education. 
So Chris has got a real passion for coaching and helping other leaders or helping bring leaders uh, on board to build teams, uh, build cultures that align and support to organisations, uh, their visions and their values. Outside of work, Chris is actively involved in developing skills and confidence of junior cricketers at the Baldwin Cricket Club. Having played over 300 games for the club, he enjoys community spirit and the team support that Cricket Club can provide to individuals and families. So Chris is going to be showcasing Lynn Fox's 4Ds approach to safety. Uh, by asking workers about the four Ds, what's dumb, difficult, dangerous, different about the work that they do. The approach has made a real impact and improvement to safety outcomes. It sounds at face level, almost simplistic questions, but it underlies a sophisticated and nuanced approach to consultation and inclusion of workers into the safety process. It's got a very practical and approachable um, in the way it's delivered. So, what this does require, though, is development of organisational trust. So you're welcome to add any questions that you've got for Chris in the chat uh, during the discussion, uh, and we can talk about that after the presentation. So welcome, Chris. Great to have you with us. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, good to be here with uh, with everyone today. Um, and look, similar to the other, other presentations, um, I'm gonna, I've got some slides to sort of guide our session today. Um, and just turning on the sound because we're going to do some sharing of some video as well. So um, my session today, as we sort of introduced, is to talk about something that we are doing differently at Linfox when it comes to safety. And uh, in real simple terms, we've introduced something called the four Ds. And so to, for today's um, short session, what I'll do is I'll talk to you about, um, explain what they are and how we apply them um, at work. I'll talk to you also, I'll go through why we introduced them. And there's some, you know, some good reasons I think that are worth sharing. Um, you may be in a similar situation to us where, uh, you know, you think, you know what, we're actually looking for this, this step change. We're looking to turn the page and have a look at, and have a go at something a bit different. We'll also sort of cover off what's worked for us. Um, we've been doing this now for just over 15 months. So um, I can talk to you about, um, what we know rather than what I reckon. Um, you know, it's really important um, to have some really, I think, some really good factual based evidence to help inform our decisions about what we are going to do next. And so we think we've got that and that's really, really helping us. Um, and look, I guess towards the end, uh, we would like to think that um, those that are, are joined us today can have a crack at um, running a 4D session um, at your workplace. Um, it's something that that is really easy. You know, it doesn't require any education outside of just having a good understanding and a good facilitator. And so um, that's a little bit about what we're going to cover off today. So just getting onto the four Ds themselves. Um, and as Andrew mentioned at the beginning, the four Ds is really about asking a very simple question to anybody in the workplace, and it and it, and it is literally anybody. And that is you know, with the work you do, tell us about what you think is dumb, difficult, different or dangerous about that job, about that task. Now, when you talk about the four Ds, when we talk about dumb, we're, we're not inferring or talking about people. It's always about the things that just don't make sense. Um, and when we run a 4D session, there is always stuff that pops out when somebody says, you know, I've been doing this for three or four months, I just don't understand why we're doing it this way. It doesn't make sense to me. You know, even there's some colourful language that gets thrown into this one. And, and you know, that's that's um, absolutely really good because we're getting to the cruts of what our team really think. When it comes to difficult, uh, I reckon, you know, certainly in our industry, we all have jobs that are just tough. Uh, our team would say that that's, that's really difficult to do and there's reasons behind it. Now, um, what we're trying to do here is to understand about that work, have we been doing the same things over and over and over again and we haven't given any consideration to new ways of thinking or new ways of doing something. When it comes to different, uh, this is more about we've introduced something new and we're now doing something different but it just doesn't make sense to those that are doing it. You know, you could be an existing um, 
uh, worker that's been doing the, the job for a long time, or you could be someone that's just, just started today. So different is a really great question. And the last one is dangerous. And no surprise when we ask that question, um, most people are telling us about something that they just feel is unsafe. Um, they feel as though it's got risk attached to it. And so asking the team what's dumb, difficult, different or dangerous about the work you do starts to uncover um, the real issues that our team um, are faced with every day. And remembering, you know, where we sit and where risk occurs, you know, we're trying to get to the pointy end of the stick. We're trying to get to what our team experience every day. And so, the, you know, you might ask, well, what was the sort of um, the, the point of which we decided to do something different? And, you know, probably like most of you and certainly in my prior roles as well, we we tried to identify hazards in all the traditional ways. Um, and then we use very traditional ways to assess risk. Um, and look, you know, when we talk to our team about these processes, uh, what we find is that um, they don't always work. Um, hazard ID with whether it be, a, you know, to do with audits or some sort of checklist can get a bit tick and flick. Um, risk assessment, you know, when it's not, when you don't involve the right people, it can be quite a time consuming and not necessarily get to all the key risks. And so accepting the fact that risk, risk assessment will always be part of work. We know that and it, it definitely has its place. But we think it has its place for very specialised situations where it's got some good experienced folk around it to facilitate a risk assessment. But for the most part, we think a lot better, a better way of getting to understanding what the hazards are, what are the things that really cause um, some difficulties for our team is to ask better questions, which is the four Ds. And some of the other reasons, I suppose, that have that's led us down this path, and you might see some of these points here that, that resonate with where you work, because this is definitely some of our experience, and I'm going to throw up on the screen now, is that, you know, we, we knew that when something went wrong, we were we actually think we're pretty good at responding, um, particularly in our industry. Um, and unfortunately, when there's lots of other factors, when we're on the road or we're in a shed, there can be things that, that don't always go to plan. And so we were putting a lot of time on responding when things went wrong. Um, and, you know, it's important to focus on the cause of injury, of course. Um, you know, we want to try and learn. But. I think our industry and probably even outside our industry is that if you're just focusing on those old metrics of TRIFA and LTIFR, then it means that you're probably not focusing on the, the, the really higher risks or critical risks that exist in our industry. Um, chain of responsibility, you know, it's been around in our industry, as we all know, for a long time. I think it's got something to say for why we're a little bit compliance orientated. Um, you know, compliance is a non-negotiable, of course, tick, we know that. But we can't be driven by compliance. Our team don't respond if we're asking them to do it because it's, it's that's what the rule says. We've got to engage the team differently if we want to get better outcomes. Um, and as a result of some of those things, we have inevitably introduced more rules, you know, more procedures. And, you know, we just introduce more. And when you start introducing more, it's tough. You know, we're making it confusing. We're, we're cluttering up our system um, for those that, that, that do the work every day. Um, and look, here's some, some comments I've put up here. And, and, and I think this is, you know, some old um, DuPont ways here where, you know, the focus can tend to be around people and behaviour, um, not particularly, you know, graded investigations. Um, that's some of the, the, the things that can lead when you've got a bit of a, a response mindset. And I've mentioned the factor around TRIFA. So in all of this, they are some of the reasons why we recognise that we've start, we need to look ahead. We need to be looking before an incident occurs. So what's the best way to do it? Well, um, 
one of the things that we put in front of our team to sort of explain why we think there are better ways is this concept called blue line, black line. Some of you might have heard of this. Um, what it does is we're looking to understand the work that we imagine as it's done compared to the work how it's actually done. And uh, blue line, black line is the simple way to refer to it. And if I show it to you here in this slide, if you think about a job that the team, that the, the guys do today, if you think about when they start, if you think about when they end, and all the moments where they make decisions to do that job well. Well, there's a good chance that if we're leaders and we are, uh, we have an oversight of what's going on, we'll be able to outline those steps, and that's called the black line. But the fact is that when we go and ask those who do this work every day, they will be telling us something slightly different, which is the blue line. We know that at that very first point when we do a job, there's a good chance that the team, on this case, they're actually adding a few steps because the steps we've said in the work procedure or the work instruction, they don't quite make sense. We need to be doing a few more things. And when it comes to the second step, they don't actually understand why we do those three things. They've taken one out. They now take a shortcut, so to speak, and they only do two things. And what you get is this variation of what actually happens compared to how we think it happens over time. Now, you might be sitting there thinking um, variation or this drift away from the black line, that can be dangerous. Well, for the most part, this drift, it's, it's innovation. It's our team finding better ways to work. The risk is when we let it go to a point where the decisions go well beyond what we would like them to be in the work instruction, and then something goes wrong. Now, this blue line, black line shows that we have some difference between what we think compared to what our workers actually do. And 4Ds is a great way to understand the blue line. It cuts through all of the technical safety jargon that we've all been using over many, many years. And it just allows us to have a really simple conversation with those who do the work every day. Now, um, one of the things that I wanted to also um, cover off is that at Linfox, um, in order for something to have a life, to give it a good chance, we knew we had to embed it into our, our, our thinking into our planning. Now, um, this is only two years old, so we're still a bit fresh at it. And, and by no means do I, do I think that this is embedded um, as far as it needs to go. We've still got a lot more work to do. But what we've done here is we've tried to come up with some core principles. Most of you will have plans, but these are core principles that hopefully guide our decisions, our behaviours, our thoughts, our planning in what we do when it comes to keeping people safe, healthy and well. And those first two that I've just highlighted there in yellow really um, fall nicely under the, the process around the four Ds. Because we believe if we ask, listen and learn from those who do the work every day, we will get better outcomes. Full stop. We also believe that we need to have a risk-based focus on not just everyday risk, but also critical risk. Now, everyday risk is a, in the four days, the four days tool is a great way to help uncover what those everyday risks are. So this is just giving you an example of what we do at Linfox to try and be very clear where some of our processes sit in our plan. Now, um, what I want to do now is actually just share with you a, a video, and I thought I had embedded it here, but I have um, failed to do that at my end. So um, I'm just going to see if we can go live with the, the video.
before I go any further, um, it probably would be good to know, Andrew, if that's coming through okay. Uh, I think we're missing the sound, um, Chris. Um, when you do sure. the share, um, yep. you just need I'll to do, do a redo the share with sound. No worries. In a 4D session, we gather a group of workers who do a specific task and we ask them four questions. What is dumb, difficult, dangerous and different about that task? And we take on their answers and we document it. It's a very simple process and it's quick and easy. The people involved in a 4D sessions include somebody we call a facilitator. So that's a person who guides the conversation, asks the questions and engages the workers. And of course, we have the workers themselves. They're the subject matter experts and we rely on them for their honest answers. There are different ways to choose a topic focus for a 4D session. So you can look at something on your site that is a high risk activity. You could look at a safe work procedure that needs updating and use the 4Ds to look at that process. You can do a 4D session after closing out an investigation when you've identified that there are issues involved in that. If you've had repeated incidents of a similar nature on your site, you can certainly run a 4D session. Or whenever you've got a new or different task starting, you can run a 4D session to review that task. I guess that the decanning of a shipper, like it, we used to obviously just store them in their original packaging straight into the pick bag. So we're decanting to then, I guess, put into a tote. Um, we could potentially just induct it with the cardboard. After a 4D session, we take the responses that have been documented and we work through them. So we identify the quick wins. They're the easy tasks that we can knock over quickly and get some traction on. We then prioritise the more complex tasks and plan them. And then we, at a later stage, we review those actions to make sure that they are working and they are enough. And importantly, through the whole process, we provide feedback to the workers who participated because it's really important that they see the actions are being taken and the progress of them. The 4D session is a great influence on safety culture because it's an honest process. We go to the people who do the work every day and we ask them how they do it and how they do it safely. And when we listen to them and take on their answers and we implement their real life actions that keep them safe, we're going to get better results. We're going to get an improvement in safety overall. But importantly, we're going to empower our people to feel confident to speak up and give us the answers to the problems that they face, make their life easier, make their work safer and make it more efficient for everyone. That was um, what you heard. Who you heard from there was Sandy. She's one of our national safety managers out on site. And, you know, I probably it's a good example where We've got the entire team um, across Linfox that are getting involved in running 4D sessions. Um, we've run over 280 sessions in the last 15 months. Uh, we've had over 2,000 Ds that have been um, uncovered. So work situations that our team have described as either dumb, difficult, different or dangerous. Um, and then the best news is that we've had over 1,500 solutions as well that have been picked up and put forward by our team. So what I want to cover off now is just if you're looking to run a session, here's some tips from us about what we've learned over time. Uh, the most important thing is to make sure that the task that you're choosing is not too big. You want to make it really small um, because you need to sort of bookend it so as you can spend all the time and effort focusing on the single job or the single task. You choose roughly two, three, four people to be involved in the session. You want diversity. You want people that understand the job, that do the job to be part of it. Choose a date, time, location, allocate around 45 minutes. You don't need anything, any special um, PowerPoint presentations. You can just drop this in anywhere around the site. All you need is maybe a whiteboard and um, some scrap paper, and you can facilitate a session by asking these simple questions. When you run the session, um, if you start, if the team start to open up and tell you about what they think is dumb, difficult, different or dangerous about the work they do, then it, it's a probably an indication that you've got enough trust in the room where they, uh, the team are saying, yep, we're happy to share this with you because you're going to do something about it. And 
So when you run the session, our experience is you can end up with anywhere between five, 10, 12 things that the team might come up with. Um, it could be less, of course, it might only be a couple. And then the, the key thing after running the session is not to go and park it and say, well, we're gonna get back to it in a few weeks time. What we wanna do is we wanna actually find the low hanging fruit. We wanna find the thing that we can go and have a look at right now. We were looking for the quick win and see if we can do something about that now. Um, we then share the outcomes with the leadership team. Now, when we run these sessions, most of the time we were asking leaders to sort of sit out the session and we do it with an independent facilitator. Um, if there is strong trust amongst the group, then of course the leader can attend. But, you know, that's a bit of a decision that each side has to make as they go. Uh, and then once we've got the four Ds and we've summarised them down into a small bunch, then we work out, okay, with the team, again, those that are doing the job, what are some of the things we can do to make work better, easier and safer for everyone? So it's about solutions. Our um, experience, as I mentioned earlier, we've done uh, lots of these sessions now. We've learned a lot. Um, and these are just some examples where we've got lots of parts of our business where the team have called out something that's dumb. The first one on the left there is just the way we stage pallets, the way we transport and move across the warehouse. And an outcome there with the team was to restage things in different locations to reduce the travel time with forklifts. And we also know that by redu reducing that, we're reducing the risk of interaction between people and plant. Some uh, efforts here to make tyre handling easier. It's a very different type of task that a lot of people are not used to. So we had some teams come through to talk to us about ways we can better um, stack the the tyres into the vehicle and then unload. Good example here with a, one of our team here on the two-way radio. You know, one of the most difficult jobs they face when in one of the yards is all the chatter that comes over the two-way radio. Um, and so they were exploring different things that they could do to reduce that chatter being a real distraction and how they can just really just stay focused on their jobs with the instructions that are coming from, from the team um, in, in the shed. And then the last one there is a dangerous one. Um, it relates to our uh, rail operations up north where the team called out that we didn't have a particular torch that's used um, red and green to communicate with one another in the event that the comms goes down. And so a really th easy thing, low hanging fruit, we can go and get those torches tomorrow. So just some examples, and I've got some more examples here, um, which are really just to show that the, the issues that people raise, they don't have to be that big. You know, this is an example in one of our sheds where some issues around how we are picking tobacco products and how they used to be shrink wrapped through a heat tunnel, just a different way of doing it and a better way of actually running the rollers as well as we move product down the line. So it, it, it's as simple as what you can see on the screen here. In our workshops, we had some issues with decanting oil um, and not enough pumps. And so, you know, the session involving the workshop guys, that was the thing that was causing them most grief. It mightn't be the highest risk, but in their eyes, every day this was causing them an issue. So a simple thing that we can go and fix. Um, another example here, just with bad lighting in containers, a really simple solution, maybe not a long-term solution, but a simple one that can be implemented today to improve lighting. And then the last one here um, with our fuels deliveries, um, we're on site, particularly at night, there's hazards with other vehicles and traffic. They used to have orange lights um, as ways um, to help motorists um, see what the areas that we'd um, cordoned off. And uh, they were too much similar to lights on the vehicle and lights on cars. And so they're now exploring a different color flared light, which is green. So these are these are simple things where we can have a go. We listen to the team and we then we explore what the options could be. Um, and so that's pretty much it for what I was going to cover off today. Hopefully I haven't gone too much over time there, Andrew. But really um, for us, this is just about asking better questions involving those who do the work every day, asking them what's dumb, difficult, different about the work they do, and uh, 
with time, we're confident that we'll be making work, you know, as it says there, better, easier and safer, you know, for everyone that works at Linfox. That's great. Thanks, Chris. And some really positive responses uh, coming through the chat and the reactions there. Um, some saying, yeah, great to see um, good human factors thinking being done um, in there and the um, uh, testing that work versus imagined versus uh, work uh, that's actually being done. So really good to see uh, an approach that uh, brings that out. Uh, people start talking about it being brilliant. Um, if there are any questions coming through, please uh, feel free to um, pop them in. Um, so yeah, and really if I could just say too, Andrew, and just, just worth mentioning as well, um, happy to share. We've got quite a few things on our 4Ds. Uh, the reason we're in the position we are is that others shared with us around some thoughts and ideas. And so, um, you know, anyone that wants to reach out, please, please do so. There's, there's a few of us on the call today. So, yeah, happy to help where we can. Yeah, terrific, terrific. Yes. Um, and, yeah, somebody just calling out, um, yeah, just how many of those um, Ds have been identified um, really demonstrates an organisation that either has trust or develops trust with their workforce. The fact that they've been called out and... Uh, so many have been actioned and responded to. And that's probably the big call out too, is that um, you, you're pretty, you know pretty quickly if you don't have trust in the session because people won't talk. Um, and it just means that you just haven't got it right. You just don't have an independent facilitator. So that's a chance to, to go back and have another go. Um, that sometimes happens. Um, but most of the time, if you get it right, you get great outcomes. Yeah. And have you seen a cultural shift or change through the organisation since this has been implemented? I think where we have good cultures, we've already got good cultures for other good reasons. And so the team feel comfortable to sort of to speak up. The biggest win with 4Ds is that it's getting to the things that really tick our team off every day. Rather than safety saying this is what I think we should look at or ops saying we should look at this, this is getting to what really matters to those who do the work every day. And so that's probably the biggest win. It's, it's redirected us to some things that we may not have put up as a high risk, but yeah. for the team, it's really important. So that's that's helping. Yep, yeah, that's sure. right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, identifying the squeakiest wheel from the worker's perspective. Yeah, the thing that really grinds their gears. Yeah, and uh, yeah, resolving those bits. Yep. Nice one. Okay. Right. Thanks so much, Chris. Really no, appreciate thanks. your Thank time. Thanks for being able to share that. Thank you. Good on you. All right. So we're going to drive right into the uh, panel session now. And the topic for our panel session today is respect at work. So you may well know that uh, in 2020, the Australian Human Rights Commission released the Respect at Work uh, report, which is Sexual Harassment National Inquiry Report. And it made 55 recommendations. Uh, that were directed to government and the private sector to prevent and address workplace sexual harassment. The Workplace Gender Equality Agency also reported that back in 2022, three quarters of the transport, postal, warehousing, industry workforce was identified as male, with only 25%, therefore, in non-managerial positions and around 26% of women in managerial positions. We actually could not find any data for how many transgender workers there are in the transport sector. So we know that there's real challenges around diversity in the workforce. Uh, there's numerous articles have been out in the um, public press around women facing significant uh, work health and safety barriers uh, in the sector uh, and challenges around discrimination. So I'm really excited to be welcoming our panel to have this conversation. So our panel is going to include Holly Conroy, Casey Horsnell and Rod Maul, who I'll start by giving a little background about before we get rolling. So we've got Holly Conroy, who's a transgender truck driver from Wagga Wagga, New South Wales. And in 2016, at the age of 37, Holly made the courageous decision to transition from male to female. In 2018, Holly set out to organise Wagga's very first Mardi Gras parade, uh, Pride Parade which is a massive success. It was held on the 9th of March back in 2019 and saw almost 20,000 people come out to watch the parade and support the event. Holly was awarded the Acon Community Hero Award and was a finalist in the 2019 New South Wales Women of the Year Awards. Uh, she's also been, there's also been a documentary made about her transition and achievements, which aired as part of SBS's Untold Australia series. So we're really pleased to have you with us here, uh, Holly. 
And Holly currently works in the transport industry as a driver for Trumit, uh, for Trumit Freight Service. Uh, I'm hoping we've also got uh, Casey Horsnell and technology is supporting us to get you on board, Casey. Uh, Casey started with Star Trek as a freight handler back in 2010. She was only one of a few women who were working as part of um, as part of that part of Star Trek at the time. And I'll leave Casey to tell her story, but suffice it to say the environment at that time wasn't a good fit for Casey and she left the industry to pursue other employment opportunities. Fast forwarding nine years though, and Casey's given Star Trek and the industry another go. With the job fit working better this time, Casey successfully progressed through a series of prom promotions with increasing scope of her role and responsibilities and leadership. Casey's now the pickup delivery fleet supervisor, which takes care of the Sydney metro area. We also have Rod Moore. Rod's currently general manager of safety and wellbeing at Australia Post. He's worked as head of safety at several large organisations covering a range of industries from logistics, public health, food manufacturing, health, waste management, oil and gas. Rod helps transform organisational cultures and capability that delivers a tangible safety performance. Rod's a director with the Australian Institute of Health and Safety and is an active member of our Transport Network Forum's working group. So welcome, Rod. Uh, I'm hoping we're also welcoming uh, Casey and Holly. Can't see them on screen yet, but fingers crossed we'll be getting them on any second now. Uh, Holly, if you want to tell us a bit about your experience, your story in the transport industry, um, and we'll kind of go around the room. Um, particularly in relation to gender inclusion and safety and what was done well or what could be could have been improved yeah hi thanks for um for having me involved with this today it's um i think it's really important to to have these discussions so as you said in the in the intro i transitioned back in 2016 um you know after a you know a long time of you know not being happy and and, and things like that so you know, that's when I really started to to begin my my new life. And, you know, I worked in a couple of industries um, in the beginning and, you know, had, you know, some positive and some some negative, but they were, you know, always just, you know, casual temp works that those job agencies sort of get you there. You know, they're temporary when you when you start into it. But seven years ago, I was extremely lucky enough to start with Tumut Freight and, you know, to not only start in the transport industry, um, I'd actually worked in the transport industry a little bit in my previous life. And, you know, I knew the sort of people, you know, who I was about to go back into that industry with and, you know, what they were like in the early 2000s when I first worked in the transport industry and what they were like when I re-entered it, you know, seven years ago, was a massive difference. Um, I was extremely nervous on my very first day at Tumut Freight. And one thing I can say really helped is, one thing with Tumut Freight is they're, they're very welcoming, very friendly. And, you know, one of the first things that was said to me when I started with them that day was, you know, you're yeah, absolutely welcome. We don't care, you know, what you, about your gender identity. We support you in every way. And straight away, that kind of, you know, created a huge relief for, for myself. So that that was amazing. Um, you know, the nerves kind of started to go away after that. And, you know, I was really made feel safe. And, and that was really important. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, and Rod, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about, about uh, your journey as well. What you've seen. Yeah, I think. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. When uh, a spray base like every organisation's um, trying to ensure that we provide a safe workplace for everyone, and uh, uh, the changes in the respected law uh, approach through legislation, I think is nothing. On one hand, it's nothing new, as in it, it really just codifies what organisations should be doing, which is identifying risk, putting in controls, and trying to. You know, improve your culture in your workplace uh, to make it more um, accepting for everyone and um, everyone should be able to come to work and feel valued and uh, regardless of, you know, um, uh, you know, just accept people for who they are, not what you want them to be or what your perceptions are. And I think, you know, we're like a real organisation, we're a work in progress. Um, 
we have some pockets of excellence and we have some pockets that need improving. Um, I would say if I was giving um, suggestions to organisations who maybe haven't looked at this or wondering where to start um, or check how they're going, I would strongly recommend they look at the Respect at Work website. There's some great tools on that that have been provided, uh, some draft risk assessments, really good guidelines on what uh, is expected of organisations or what could help people to meet those, uh, the, the intent. Um, the gone are the days where you can just rely on individuals to just be decent humans and you know, the, the good people will be good and the not so good people will be uh, challenged. But I think it's more about the other observation I would say is we've got, what, four generations in the workplace now. What was acceptable when someone started in the, you know, when I started work 40 years ago, um, is not what is accepted today, thank goodness, to be honest. But um, there are people in the workplaces who haven't really changed much. There, um, you know, they may be in those pockets where there's not been a lot of change or not a lot of diversity, and it may be quite challenging to um, some of these concepts and some of these ways of working. But it's really important. So, you know, that that would be my suggestion. Is uh, if you haven't looked at looked at the Respect at Work um, website, go through that. Um, Australia Post, we've done, we've refreshed our contact uh, offices. So we, we found that that had sort of uh, hadn't had a bit of energy put into it for a while. So we've, you know, offered up our, our people who would like to be renewed in that space, help those people who've been doing it for a while who want to step down because, you know, it's not something that necessarily um, people keep the energy at the whole time. Um, things have moved on in their lives. So we've refreshed those. We've got more contact offices than we've had uh, ever. Um, we've done some refresh training and uh, uh, to really and, and trying to pick that we have a real mix of backgrounds and, uh, and, and age groups and facilities uh, around the country that will allow anyone to be able to find someone they can relate to. Uh, we're trying to promote that more. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, look at some of the guidelines that say you really should do much more uh, training more regularly, so annually rather than we were doing it once every two years for some of this uh, sort of awareness training. So we've really stepped that up as well, done a lot of promotion. So there's some of the practical things we've been doing at Australia Post. We certainly aren't uh, perfect, um, and but we are really committed to improving ourselves and uh, and taking steps to make it a more accepting workplace. And hopefully we get Casey on because she's. Um, like Holly got a, an interesting experience from when she first started originally um, at Star Trek and what she found there versus what she finds now. And, and I think the concept that really resonated with me and a lot of people is it's the same organisation, but sometimes the workplace can be quite hostile, um, unintentionally usually. But uh, but you know that's something people need to be aware of. It's not just policies and procedures. It's what is it? feel like as you walk into the organisation hall and I'm sure that's what you're experiencing in your different workplaces over your time and, and that um, that hostile workplace you need to identify it and deal with it. Um, look at your uh, indicators, so, you know, where you've got a high turnover or where you've got, you know, people who are from different backgrounds or minorities and if they're coming into a workplace where that hasn't had a lot of that in the past then there's a fair chance that's a higher risk place than a, a workplace that's more diverse. So. Again, there are things you can look at to try and go, well, we might need to do a little bit more effort in that type of environment that we would in one that's, uh, you know, more used to change or having a more diverse workplace. So thanks, Andrew. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and I can tell you the, uh, the team is um, working furiously behind the scenes trying to get uh, uh, Casey in. Uh, so there's a few uh, technical um, issues um, behind the scenes that there are, they're working through. Uh, so Holly, I know that in your story, it's sometimes it's some of the um, the small things that make a really big difference. Um, the messaging from leadership, um, and sometimes it's the big things as well that are really important. Um, is there anything you can sort of talk about or kind of talk to around uh, some of those sort of positive or some of those small things that can shift um, the difference for you feeling safe and included? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I said in the beginning, I I worked for a few other companies before I got into the transport industry after transitioning. Uh, and one company that really I found was doing massive steps forward as far as diversity goes was Lendlease. Um, when I first got there, you know, you open your employee portal and right there is a 
policy that you can click into um, that's specifically written to include transgender uh, people, everyone from the LGBTI, of course, um, but there were specific guidelines in there written for, for trans people. And, you know, seeing that, being a new employee, you know, without even really needing to talk to anyone there, um, really, really helped. So I, I guess having those sorts of things in, in, in employee portals and websites and, and things like that um, is a really easy way to, to become at ease, I guess. Um, so that was one thing that I really found. And obviously with Tumor Freight, um, I can't say enough good things about that company. Uh, I think the big one with them is, you know, when I first started there, the owner of the company, you know, came up and asked, if it was okay to ask questions and I think that's really important is you know getting permission to 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 ask these things and you know I was more than happy to to extend that and say yeah absolutely um you know but thank you for thanks for asking you know it really helped it again putting me at ease and and making my transition into the transport industry you know so much smoother so I think they're the two key things for me is, you know, basically just asking the question and, you know, having that information that's readily available, you know, without necessarily needing to confide in anyone, you know, especially for anyone that hasn't come out yet, you know, and, you know, they want to know that when they do decide to make that big decision, and it is an extremely hard decision, um, you know, if you've never had to, never had to do that. And, you know, it really does help. They're, they're little things, but they're also big things at the same time that, that really make a big difference. Terrific. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Uh, and welcome, Casey. Uh, we've managed to navigate through the technical challenges. It's so great to have you um, on board. Uh, I'm not sure how much you managed to capture the conversation uh, apart from kind of navigating the technology. I've actually been here for over an hour, so I don't, <laughs> I, I, I've heard everyone. I've heard Ron, I've heard Holly, I've heard Chris, I've heard everyone. So I, I'm not sure what's going on there, but I do apologise. <laughs> That's all right. We're going to just blame Microsoft and the, um, the <laughs> yeah. system, not not ourselves. I've been texting um, so, everyone frantically saying I'm here. Like, <laughs> so it's so good to have you here. I would love to hear a bit about your story and your sort of experience in the transport industry um, as far as kind of gender inclusion and safety goes. Certainly. So I actually first started with Star Trek in 2010, um, just as an outside hire freight handler. And I came in um, with Chandler McLeod and I was just doing my thing. And then after a couple of months, I actually got offered a permanent role. Uh, when I first started, though, there was only a few females that worked there. So I was a little bit intimidated and I was in my early, um, I think I was about 19 or 20 at the time so yeah when they offered me the permanent position I thought oh this is not the industry for me I don't think so I went on my way and I uh, went back to office what I was comfortable with and then fast forward nine years later and um, I'm back on the doorstep of Star Trek and as an outside hire again uh, but on the PM shift this time so when I originally started I was on the AM um, but then yeah I found myself on the PM shift I would not long got off maternity leave and then um, yeah so I just within my maternity leave at my previous job I didn't actually get paid maternity leave so I uh, after six months of being on maternity leave um, I found myself needing to work a few hours again just to get myself back into the industry of work and then yeah so I found myself back on the doorstep of Star Trek and only working four or five hours and then that uh, very quickly increased the six, seven, eight hours in the night. Um, after a couple of months, I found myself as a team leader of the dangerous goods section, still as an outside hire. And then after about eight months, um, I found myself coming as a permanent to Star Trek. And to be honest with you, like when I first started all those years ago, there was only a few females. And then when I came back nine years later, um, there was 11 females. So I felt a little bit more secure I was a little bit more grown up, so um, I was like, yep, let's take this on. And then, yeah, um, once I, my maternity leave was up with my previous job, I just said to him, I want to stay with Star Trek. I'm not going to come back. So, um, yeah, I, I very quickly moved my way up within the Star Trek organisation. Um, so, yeah, started off as Dangerous Goods team leader as an outside hire, moved into permanency, uh, then I very quickly found myself as a senior team leader 
Um, so I was covering the various different departments. Um, any team leader that was off in the different departments for that day, I'd fill in for them. Um, so I, I very quickly learnt my way across the Minchinbury facility uh, in the various departments. And then not long after that, I was promoted into an acting senior supervisor role where I took care of the bulk shed, wishbones, dangerous goods. Um, and then not long after that, I found myself in Lion Hall as an acting senior supervisor where I stayed for a, a couple of years. And then my son's actually due to go to big school next year. So I found myself transitioning to the AM um, as a PUD supervisor in October last year. Um, and that's where I currently sit now, taking care of the pick up and deliver freight across the Sydney metro region. Great, thanks, Casey. And so Casey, have you seen uh, much change uh, in the industry since you started from that sort of first experience that you've had um, to kind of your more recent experience? Definitely have. So as I said before, I um, started off with only a few females in 2010. Uh, there was probably about four from memory. And then when I left and came back nine years later, it ended up being um, 11 females. But then very quickly within the two years that I was there, it, it changed to 48 females across the AM and PM shifts just in the Minchinbury facility alone. Um, so as you can see, a very big increase from what I was previously used to. Um, and of course, I became the Women in Transport Chairwoman. So that um, broadened the horizons for a lot of insight into um, how, how good the women in transport was growing. Um, and, you know, be, uh, being able to assist all the women that were coming on board, letting them know that it's not as daunting as it would have been 10 years ago um, and just to hold in there and you know that the support's coming so it's been a really good um, eye-opener and it's been a really good experience thus far. Okay, thanks and Holly have, have you seen much change uh, across your time in the transport industry? Yeah absolutely um, like Casey just said you know there's a lot more women uh, in the transport industry now, and you especially see a lot more female drivers, which is which is really good to see, you know. Um, so I think that's one of the, the biggest changes that I've seen. Um, as far as diversity goes, absolutely. Um, from when I first worked in the transport industry in, in the early 2000s to, to now working in the tran transport industry as a transgender woman, I definitely have seen massive leaps. Um, you know, I get guys who, you know, 10 years ago would have been intimidated from that would come up, you know, after organising the Wagga Mardi Gras, for example, uh, here in Wagga, we had a massive turnout, 20,000 people turned up to watch. The weeks after that first initial Wagga Mardi Gras that we had in various depots around the place, I had, you know, big guys who you know I would normally be intimidated of coming up and congratulating me on on a good event um you know a couple saying that they took their grandkids down to to check it out as it is a an absolute family event um so yeah I think they're some of the biggest changes I've seen um just in the way people are towards other people I think we're getting kinder in saying that, we still do have a long way to go. You know, I've also been in those depots where, you know, I've heard, you know, seen two guys like, check this out, check this out, you know, nudging each other as I'm walking towards them blatantly right in front of me. You know, I, I still see stuff like that. You know, I still hear people talking in the background while I'm loading a truck at, at a at a foreign depot that, that I don't really ever go to. So, Look, while it is getting better, there's still a, a lot of progress that, that needs to be made. Um, but yeah, all in all, I think the transport industry in total is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's great. You know, it's, it's done me a lot of favours and, you know, the positivity that I've gotten out of the transport industry over the last few years has absolutely outweighed, you know, any of the negative stuff that, that I have had to deal with. And, you know, one last thing on the negativity stuff. Um, one thing that I, did, that I did find is Chum at Freight every time, you know, were absolutely behind me to support me. You know, in a couple of cases, it was, you know, people I was delivering a package to um, made a comment to me. And, you know, I told the boss and the boss went, right, you're not going there anymore. You know, we're not going to houses that 
are going to disrespect you like that. So from now on, they can pick their freight up from the depot. Um, and if it continues, they can pick it up from the Wagga depot because we actually, you know, cut freight for another company. So they were adamant that, you know, every time they'd stand absolutely behind me. And that, that's another very important thing that, that I've noticed as well. Yeah, that's great. And that can be a big call for a small company to kind of make that step, you know, to a customer and say, no, we're, we're going to stand behind our employee and, you know, Absolutely. you're going to have to wear the impost. So, yeah, that's yeah. Um, that's really good. Um, Rod, uh, I'd be interested in to kind of get a sense of your experience um, across there, but also can to kind of know the things that you think are making a difference in that shift. You know, I've heard both Casey and Holly say that things have transitioned. What are the things? Is it just representation or are there other sort of factors that are starting to uh, tip the needle. Well, I think uh, I think definitely rep- as as both uh, Holly and Casey have said, I think you know hiring more a diverse workforce is really key to to um, uh, breaking down barriers and and getting a different mindset in the in the teams. And I think where as I said earlier, where where you're hiring into those areas that haven't had a lot of change, I do think as an organisation you need to put a bit more effort in or a lot more effort in some cases to prepare the ground and support those. Those, uh, that change, um, whether it's, you know, physical infrastructure. I remember in a different organisation, uh, you know, the first time they had a female apprentice, you know, they didn't have female toilets, for example, or, you know, it was um, that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, you need to prepare the ground for the work, whether it's the physical assets and look at that, or whether it's the, um, you know, starting to work with that team and the team leaders, understanding what people will need to feel supported, having a buddy appointed, um, trying to, to get into that. I think that the key to all of this is about culture and leadership and organisations need to invest heavily in culture and leadership and, and um, promote days. Uh, it was a great colleague that you talked about, you know, your involvement with the Wagga um, Mardi Gras, I think things like that, you know, as Australia Post, you know, does a lot of work on um, we're a big supporter of, we have a, a group called Post Pride and we get heavily involved in a lot of those types of activities um, and, and get people involved in Mardi Gras, et cetera. We also do a lot of promotion of those sort of issues around the organisation. Um, I think organisations, you do need to, to support and promote and uh, uh, the benefits of a diverse workforce. I mean, um, and in that bit where you'd be surprised where people do feel it. So, you know, people do have um, networks of friends and family who may not appear to you on, on the face, but you may not have anything in common with. Actually, you probably find you do. But it's about getting those influences um, involved as well. But leadership's been key. I know in Casey's land, um, the leadership team at that facility that she worked out of has spent a lot of effort promoting um, and supporting women to move into leadership roles. That's been really important out at Minchinbury. Um, and it's a much more diverse leadership team. Whilst there's a smaller number of workers who are female, but more than they were, a much more balanced leadership team, which is really important as well. And supporting um, leaders from diverse backgrounds to to go in. So, um, you know, there's uh, at Australia Post we have a project, Project Me, which is really women empowerment um, program, which uh, um, Casey's probably been on. It's it's a fantastic initiative. Um, I, I've been involved in it as well, as, uh, but it's mainly a female-led and female-involved pro- process, um, which, uh, you know, so if you can have access to something like that and develop your own or, or, or go through an external network. Um, we do a lot of work in, um, uh, you know, traditionally we've been doing uh, stock for safety back in the day. We did about 10 years in a row of that and we would put a lot of diversity stories into that. We do that through different forums now, but... I think they're really important, Andrew, to to look at ways um, you can support people. And I'd really like maybe Casey and Holly to say if you're giving advice to people on the line, so organisations, what is one or two things that management could do or should do um, or have done to support you that you haven't already mentioned? So maybe, Casey, if you want to say what is the one or two things you'd say is different that that you'd recommend for lots of companies to, to think about? I just think, like, especially in transport, the Women in Transport initiative has really um, given guidance to a lot of women, um, you know, makes them feel more wanted, more supported. Um, and obviously being 
I'm, I'm the chairwoman for women in transport. So being able to support the women. I remember um, a lady first starting, she's a young mum like myself, uh, 35 years of age, and, and she came in as an outside hire just like I did. And um, she said, like, she was so overwhelmed the first day that she started. Um, and then she saw me signing them all in and she thought, you know, um, well, she's a female, she can do it in a transport industry. And then after having conversations with her and just telling her about my journey and everything, she was actually, um, that that's what made her stay. She said, you know, I looked at you and I thought, if you could do it, so can I. And she goes, knowing that you're a young mum, you know, finding your way in the transport industry. I told her about my past experience when I was here um, nine years prior to that. So, yeah, it, it actually kept her staying. And now she's one of our better hire duties on the PM shift. Um, she's very resilient, um, fantastic worker. She's a beautiful person. And, you know, like she she's going to go far within the company. <clears throat> Obviously, children sometimes hold you back, as we all know. But, um, Certainly, she hasn't let that daunt her, and she, her, her one of her sons has actually got special needs. So, for her to still be able to continue the way that she does and have that support network around her, both outside of work and inside of work, um, you know, it's pushed her to to be the best that she can be and continue to be that way. So, um, yeah, I'm super happy that I can be there to support the women and show them that. It is, um, you know, it's not as hard as you think it's going to be. They know my past experience versus my present experience and they, they can see just from the journeys that I tell how far um, the transport industry has come as a whole. So it's, I, I'm actually, it humbles me to know that I can be a part of that as well. And just to see the transition between how many women were there before versus now and the that was 18 months ago when there was 48 women across the AMPM. There's even more now. So just on my dock, I, I take care of two docks within the PUD facility. Um, just within the two docks, I have three women that work, well, technically four, one of them's an outside hire. Um, but that already goes to show that it used to be all males and, um, you know, over time that more females have come into the business. So it's not as scary industry as we thought it once was. Um, and there's certainly room to grow. And, and with everyone's support and guidance, um, you know, it's only going to get better from here. Yeah. Yeah, Holly, it's very Holly, hard to Holly. imagine yourself. Sorry, Rod. It's very hard to um, imagine yourself in a role if you can't see somebody else in that role. So, yeah, it's um, yeah, really start to shift. Um, yeah. Rod, you were saying? Oh, I was just going to say, Casey um, reminded me of, you know, things that organisations, our responsibility is to make sure we have policies and processes in place to support people with flexible um, work because, it, you know, one of the challenges is if you stick to the traditional types of approaches that cater to the majority of the workforce, it won't cater to people who have, have different needs. And I do think organisations, you do need to look hard at what's, what and talk to the people involved about what can you do to make their lives easier. Um, and, you know, uh, child um, responsibilities is definitely one, but there's lots of other responsibilities people have caring for older, older relations or disabled or a disadvantaged um, backgrounds, that sort of stuff. So I do think they also come into play um, yeah. appropriately if it's required. And not like, you know, me to leave my previous role um, when I came over to Star Trek just to be an outside hire to just earn some money while I was off a of maternity leave. Um, Besides my progression within Star Trek that I didn't foresee, you know, before my journey, um, one of the things that kind of made me look at Star Trek and be like, well, I think I want to stay here is the fact that you you did offer maternity leave. So my previous industry, although it was transport as well, they didn't offer maternity leave. So it's those little one percenters, I guess you would say, that, you know, make you think, oh, OK, that's probably a better opportunity for me. And then to see how far I've progressed within a what I would say a short period of time, um, it, it, it just gives you inspiration and hope that it's only going to get better from here. So, yeah, the support and guidance I've had in the last five years of my journey back in Star Trek has just been absolutely amazing. So, you know, there's still a lot to improve on, as Holly um, mentioned earlier, but there's certainly, um, we've come a long way and we're only going to continue to get better the more and more we have these types of conversations and, you know, um, the more and more we, we bring more females into the business, I guess. Yeah, and it's interesting, some of those policies like more flexible caring arrangements and those sorts of things, 
um, although may initially be pushed by a change in gender um, in the workplace, actually can help change the fixed stereotypes that we have about our gender roles, which kind of means, whereas maybe males might not have been as happy to speak up and say, hey, actually, I want a bit more flexibility to spend time with the kids or whatever. Now those um, positions are in, or those policies are in place, they're more likely to actually take them up and go, that's a reasonable thing to do. So yes. um, love to hear from you, Holly, about um, if there was sort of one or two recommendations or things that you could think for uh, to throw to workplaces or employers. Yeah, look, I think we've kind of, I've, I've been really lucky, um, you know, working for a company that is pretty much doing it all right now. Um, I can't think of anything that that Chim at Freight could do now that that would be would be an improvement. Um, you know, apart from possibly you know putting information on the website, um, you know, and things like that. Um, I know they 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 do participate in. So I've actually got a program going with. Um, it's a basically a a safe environment sort of thing. It's a it's a welcome here sort of thing where, um, you know, they've put the stickers up on the windows, you know, to let anyone collecting parcels or just anyone in general to know that they're an accepting workplace. So little things like that, you know, putting up signs, you know, especially in lunchrooms and things like that where employees can see them um, and maybe introducing, um, you know, toolbox talks, you know, once a month that, you know, are uh, specific. So, you know, your toolbox talk might be specifically about LGBTI or or trans inclusion. Um, you know, that way the message sort of doesn't get lost in amongst a whole other messaging that that might be in the toolbox meeting. Um, so, I think having specific like specific things like that in place. You know, like Lendlease and their their employee porthole with with all the information. Um, right there for anyone to see. So I think for me they're the big key things. You know we've we've spoken on it about on numerous occasions with quite a few people today where education being the most important thing. And you know going forward, you know as as cliche as it sounds, education really is the the most important thing. Um, so I think just keep educating people. Forums like this are a great idea. So congratulations on, on an amazing forum because these things really do help. Uh, and they make people like myself um, and I know, you know, women like Casey who, you know, want to balance the family and, and work life and, you know, need that incorporated in, into everything. So, you know, I think they're the, the, the main things that, that we can take away. Yeah, great. So um, I can to kind of shift the conversation towards um, the role that leadership um, can play, um, Rod, in sort of promoting a culture of respect, inclusion and psychological um, safety. Um, can you kind of give us a few tips and pointers about things that um, leadership can do as far as um, promoting a culture? I think um, one of the keys is uh, um, being vulnerable yourself as a leader um, and being open. Um, I, I do think, you know, the uh, fact that, you know, you're uh, open and trusting, building a relationship of trust with the people in your team is more likely that they're going to want to step up and they'll feel supported to do so. Um, or they'll um, raise with you issues that you can improve where they're not feeling safe. And I, I, do, I do go back to that bit that's really resonated with a lot of us about the um, unintended hostile work for workplace that you may have a great overall feel but there's a pocket that, that just doesn't feel welcoming to people and I think as a leader we need to identify those places and if we're in charge of those places work really hard to change that be that uh, and find out and it's not just educating but actually that is key but also putting in place clear guidelines on what you will do and I, I you know really resonated with uh, Holly uh, when she was um, talking about going to those places and people are talking about you blatantly in front of you. You know, as a leader, you've got to stamp that stuff out and be really clear that this is unacceptable, this is not what we do, and if you continue, this is not the place for you, right? And because I don't think it's up to the person in the team member to have to call that out as much as that's, um, it's it's up to the leaders to stamp that out. And and, uh, and I do think you can do it, but... Um, uh, and, and building that relationship with trustful people will raise that so that the Hollies and the Casey's and, and other people are prepared to actually tell you what's going on. 
um, or other team members, ideally, ultimately, you know, have other team members stamp it out for you, want to say, Andrew, this is not acceptable, you shouldn't be saying that. And, uh, you know, that takes time and effort, um, but they're certainly, uh, from a leader, the things you can do. And like I said, as, a, as an organisation, there's a lot of other things you can do to support leaders in that space, but, but also being really clear and holding leaders to account to say, well, your job is to actually deal with that. It's not to just kick it upstairs or or ignore it because it's too difficult to deal with, which often it is, by the way. You know, we, we're far from perfect and we occasionally come across segments of our workforce who, who aren't welcoming and have been hostile and we have to deal with that. Um, and uh, and that's difficult because some of those, I can imagine being a frontline supervisor or team leader, and I have been in the past, where people are quite intimidating to work for you, quite aggressive and assertive, and um, but you've just got to stand stand your ground and, and be really clear about your values as an organisation and as a team. And, and most people will back you on that. It's probably a really small group who, who drive really terrible outcomes. Um, and I think the vast majority of people will stand behind the leaders if you show vulnerability and care um, and, um, and, and put boundaries around it. Yeah. And yeah, people's thanks. opinions will change over time. Um, but uh, if not, they need to leave and go and work somewhere else. Yeah, I listened to a really interesting presentation the other day about the power of the bystander effect um, and so the importance yeah. of leadership messaging, but the opportunity that everyone has that leadership opportunity to call out something that is uncomfortable, um, that where somebody has objectified somebody else or something like that to actually say, oh, wow, that's uncomfortable, or I'd feel really uncomfortable if that happened to me. So yeah. you're not having to kind of say this isn't unacceptable here, but actually just speaking directly from your own experience. And they're saying the power of the bystander effect of not saying anything is an effect giving it tacit approval. So it's you're condoning yes. the behaviour and supporting it by the fact that you've remained silent versus actually speaking up in some way and saying, hey, I find it uncomfortable. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's, that's true, Andy. Leadership and... That's why you need to invest in your leaders as well. Like you need to spend time and effort building leader capabilities, supporting them, guiding them. Um, and uh, you know, and if people aren't comfortable in that space, then you, they maybe shouldn't be the leaders in the in the in the business. But um, you know, uh, the, the one story I shared with Andrew um, in a in a different environment, we were talking about this sort of thing. Is I got a team member who joined Australia Post, and she was the first female. Forklift driver in, um, in Queensland back in the day, and uh, she came back one day and found a noose hanging off the off the uh, forklift. You know, this is twenty plus years ago, um, and it was just you know that person. I said, well, surely that person would have been, you know, terminated. No, no, they weren't terminated. <laughs> so that's the environment. You know, it was as little as twenty years ago existed, and there were people in the workforce in in every workforce who grew up in that environment where that was. Um, either ignored or, or put up with, um, and that's where it works. You know, we need to work hard on it because, you know, times have changed, thankfully, and um, that is no longer acceptable, and it certainly wouldn't be accepted in our workplace, as Casey would know. But, it, um, you know, it, it takes work and effort, and you've got to stamp that stuff out and, and be really clear on what the expectations are at the work because you can control the workforce or the workplace. You cannot you know, change people's minds at home necessarily, but over time they will change if their behaviours at work are, you know, um, uh, are, are really clear. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, um, it's not actually humour, the um, example that you pointed out, but um, where there is kind of, you know, workplace humour, um, what's perceived when you're in the in-group yeah. and the safety of the in-group, um, the comfort of that, um, you can be a lot more liberal Whereas, you know, we do need to think about um, people who are not in the in-group and what the impact of, you know, a piece of um, humour might be, you know, how that might impact on somebody else. So we oh, do I... Yeah, sorry, Rod, keep going. I was just going to say, you know, I, I know myself the things that um, I thought were funny when I was 20 at work are not funny at, you know, in my 50s at work. And, and that's as I've matured and learned. And uh, and I'm sure that's really everyone, right? So... It's, you know, we need to learn and evolve and uh, and move forward. But humour is really, uh, uh, often humour can, like, humour is really important and, and laughter, I love, you know, I'm sure we all do. Like, it's great if you're working in a team where that's, you know, part of it, but you've got to be really careful what 
what type of humour you're using because you certainly don't want you're to give offence no, you... or create, create an environment that makes it um, difficult and one person's humour is another person's. Um, you know, it can be taken yeah, quite personally. Yeah. Casey, were you um, making a comment there? Yeah, I just I just think to myself, it's just, you know, like um, there's a time and place for everything. And at the same time, like, yeah, you've got to understand there's humour in some people and humility in others. So, you know, you've got to understand um, where you can make the jokes and where you can't. And I guess, to be honest with you, like maybe because, and, and I'm not putting bad mouth on anything, but maybe because I started at Star Trek 10 years ago uh, or 13 years ago, it might have been different to take, Australia Post taking over now because I know very damn well that um, Australia Post promote LGBTQIA plus and you know they have their postal boxes that have all the gay pride symbols around it with the rainbows and everything so um, you know it might just come from the past times to now where everything's you know inclusive and diversity and all the rest of it but it, it is amazing to see um, and I guess you know especially as a leader um, just as, as Rod said before, if you hear that things, it's just coaching them and guiding them and making them understand that, you know, we're in the 21st century and anything's possible. I mean, like I always look back and it might sound a bit bizarre, but I always look back and say, well, how did we even get here? You know, that this, you know, if, if that's possible, anything's possible. So, you know, however people want to identify themselves or however they want to perceive themselves, that's on them, you know, and we just need to understand, like, nothing's right and nothing's wrong as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, I'm, I'm just glad that all these years later, um, Australia Post specifically are accepting um, and, and more, more and more companies along the way are accepting um, everyone's different and everyone has a voice and everyone can do what they want to do, um, you know, and everything's going to be okay as long as we support and guide them. That's all we can really ask for, um, yeah. you know, so that's what... I, as a leader, um, portray to my people is just like, nothing's right, nothing's wrong. You know, there's always a way to deal with something. Um, you know, if you're having issues or you can't understand something, come and get the guidance and support that you need. So the more and more events that we have and the more awareness that we make around every type of situation, whether it be Holly's situation or the amount of other situations we have, as long as we give that guidance and support and yeah, especially I, I I remember telling telling you last time, Andrew, um, just around the mental health, like, you know, everyone goes through it at some point in their lives. And I think, you know, as a leader, um, is if everyone has a basic understanding of the signs and symptoms to look out for with that, um, you know, along with everything else as well, I think it's gonna make make our jobs and um, you know, us very it's just going to be much easier for everyone to understand support and guide where we need to yeah yeah nice yeah i really like what you said there about that humility and that um that willingness to kind of look at the impact that you might have had on somebody else as well so it's that um you know we want to have enough trust to be able to have a good time at work and to you know uh, if you put out a joke but it's then requires the commitment of the person to be curious and connected to go oh did that land badly or you know did that have kind of the wrong impact and actually reach back to you know and say holly did that you know upset look like you had a bit of a reaction Are you okay uh, and then do the quick recovery rather than just ignore you know a potential impact on somebody have you seen people be kind of reflexive holly or kind of that work where people have um something's landed badly and they've stepped back in yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say so. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah, I, I, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Yeah, I, it's I, weird, I, kind I, of maybe. maybe audio somebody, sort of skipped as you were talking. It. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. So yeah, we maybe somebody's made a, a comment or a question or a bit of humour that kind of has landed poorly. Um, they've then seen a response and then kind of reached back in to say, "Oh, look, sorry." Um, did I upset you or offend you or, you know, I didn't mean, you know, so that quick response and recovery? Yeah, look, not so much in the workplace. Um, absolutely in my in my social lives um, it, it has happened. Um, no, I don't notice it so much in the workplace. I think, um, I think a lot of people, you know, when it comes to that sort of thing, you know, 
kind of hold back a little bit. Um, I don't really notice it a great deal in a work environment, but absolutely socially, um, probably on a regular basis. Yeah. To me, it doesn't really matter how you identify yourself. At the end of the day, we're all human. Um, so, you know, like whatever you choose to do should be what you choose to do. I don't see why that should be perceived any differently. Everyone has their absolutely. different views their different views, their different opinions on, you know, so many different things, whether it be human um, rights or, you know, the, the workplace agreements or whatnot. But at the end of the day, like, you are you and you shouldn't be tarnished because of that. That's who you choose to be and that that's all that needs to happen. Like, I just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you, Casey. Um, it should be pretty simple. But, uh, yeah, we, we make it pretty complicated at times as humans, don't we? Um, so interesting, so far we've been focusing on um, sort of gender diversity, inclusion and safety. And I'm interested to know just a couple of sort of thoughts as we get towards the end around um, other forms of less represented diversity. So it might be sort of racial, cultural, um, age or ability or neurodiversity, you know, and some opportunities or challenges or lessons that might translate across from gender into those other forms of diversity. Yeah, I can um, throw a couple of points, you know, just something that's happened today, Andrew, um, you know, I had a, a friend um, of mine, whose son has a learning disability and um, what Australia Post does in those instances is we actually um, help guide those people through the recruitment process um, and give them, um, you know, and, and we work with the union to, to also make sure that we're not disadvantaging people, but actually going, it's difficult if you have a, 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 a particular disadvantage um, sometimes within in, in, uh, in recruiting in Indigenous um, and Torres Strait Islander peoples, we also need to help guide them through because some of the requirements are quite challenging to get into the standard recruitment process. So I, there are a couple of examples where um, in, in real terms, you need to look at what's holding those groups back. You want to have a more diverse workforce and, and try and work through barriers um, and put solutions in place to assist. Um, and I think that's something every organisation can look for. It's, it's very easy to, um, you know, to, to keep trying to fish in the same pool the same way you always have, but you really want to increase diversity. I think you've got to look at what, what, uh, what might be holding that back and, and learn the lessons and put some solutions in place. But they're two that come to mind immediately for us. And, and certainly linguistically challenged, um, you know, we've had, um, you know, we've got people who are deaf uh, working for us and, you know, we've got a, a deaf forklift driver in Queensland was the first deaf forklift driver. We had to put specific um, extra work in to support that individual in the team to make sure that he was feeling safe to operate, um, but he, he's loving it, you know. Um, and there are, you just need to work a little bit harder and put a little bit of thought into it and work with the individuals involved or people from that type of group background and you can find solutions. And uh, I don't think anyone's too blessed with an overabundance of um, high quality pool candidates to work. We're always looking for really good people and sometimes that just means we need to work a little bit harder to, to find solutions for them. When, uh, but there are a couple of ones for us. Right. Um, does anyone want to make any concluding comments, um, Holly or Casey? Yeah, well, one thing that I've noticed that, I mean, and it's obviously it's a problem everywhere, but, you know, as a driver, um, you know, and you've got your UHF on for, you know, you've obviously got it on for, for safety reasons, you know, you so you can communicate traffic conditions and, and hazards and things like that, and drivers can communicate with each other. The problem lies, you know, you hear a lot of racism um, over the radios and, you know, especially uh, aimed towards, you know, specific um, nationalities and things like that. And, you know, it, it's quite off-putting, even though you're not part of that nationality, because, you know, these people are representing Australia and and everything that we believe in. And, you know, there's been so many times where, I've just had to turn my radio off and and only turn it on when I when I need to use it sort of thing purely because of the language and 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 attitudes and, and things like that 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 are over the airways so you know I think one thing that needs to be I, I have no idea how you would do it 
you know, whether companies are putting listening devices in trucks, I don't know. It, be, it really does, you know, incringe on on personal rights then and, and things like that. So, it, look, it's, it's a touchy one, but they absolutely need to be, be monitored because some of the language you hear coming over those airways is not only disrespectful, but it's just downright dangerous, you know, having drivers behind the wheel and hearing some of the aggression coming through the airways, I, I'd hate to feel the energy and aggression that's inside the cab of their truck and holding onto that steering wheel. So um, that to me is probably one of the biggest problems the transport industry has coming from a driver's point of view. Um, so yeah, for me, that would be something we haven't spoke about today that absolutely needs to be addressed. And it affects everything we've spoken about today. It affects mental health. You know, having the having the wrong said by, you know, your keyboard warrior over the radio could drive someone to, to suicidal thoughts. Um, you know, speaking from someone who has survived that. So, you know, the triggers are there. Um, so yeah. It, it, it absolutely plays into everything we've been we've been speaking to today, and and you know is a massive problem in the transport industry. Yeah, yeah, and it's a really big um, issue that you've um, opened up there because it's it's something that's about the public common because um, you know that uh, could be social media as well that basically anyone has access to you know those airways or the um, public. I think I have a UHF. Yeah, anyone who's got that. You know, you get that, people so. in utes and caravans and, and things like that, which is fine. You know, those people should be allowed to have those things because everyone on the road, you know, should have access to road conditions and, and, and things like that. And and being on the Channel 40, you know, it's it's the best place to get some of that information. You know what I mean? You know, you've got some of the most experienced drivers in our country being truck drivers, um, you know, on the radios, it would ju just be better if, you know, we could somehow regulate those airways, um, you know, whether it's education through company or, as I said, putting devices in trucks, which would be obviously be a last a last resort. Um, but, yeah, it needs to be addressed. Yeah. Or even maybe highlighting somebody had put in uh, the chat earlier about both the bystander and the upstander effect of um, actually really acknowledging, you know, your team or your staff or, you know, anyone who's actually said, hey, that's a bit rich, mate, you know, settle down, you know, so that's actually kind of helping to squash the conversation uh, in there. Yeah, well, there's been two occasions where the conversation got that bad and the just happened that the truck they were driving was covered in their company's um, logo. So I, I actually, on two, on two occasions, I have actually... Um, you know, call, call the company and, and let them know, you know, the sorts of things their drivers were saying, but not all trucks are marked and, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, thanks. And, and people have acknowledged, yeah, thanks for highlighting some of those issues in the chat there. Um, any concluding comments, Casey? Yeah, I just, just think that as long as we continue to do what we do as Australia Post and many other companies now, um, coaching, guiding, supporting our staff to just realise that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what gender you are, um, what race you are, we're all human at the end of the day and we all deserve a right and a voice to speak um, and be who we are. So as long as, yeah, we continuously um, offer that support and guidance, um, then we can be amazing. You know, for me to experience what it was like 10 years ago versus what it's like now, um, we're only going to get better from here if we keep doing what we're doing. So, um, you know, like, let, let's just raise awareness, that guidance and support and continue doing so. Yeah, great. Um, so I think we might wrap there. We've um, sort of gone slightly over time, but it was a very rich uh, and um, really useful conversation. So from all of us here today, I really want to thank um, Holly, Casey, Rod, uh, for being part of the conversation and all of you who've participated uh, through the chat uh, and online there. I really appreciate your thoughts and insights. I personally think that conversation around respect and psychological safety at work was a really good starting point for an industry that's got some significant human resource challenges because um, the industry really remains predominantly male, middle-aged and Caucasian. And so there's some clearly some broader demographics uh, with more limited inclusion. Uh, and so it's critical for um, all of our workforces to feel both physically and psychologically safe. And there's always more that we can do. Uh, our conversation, I reckon, this afternoon's really been interesting and valuable. 
uh, and uh, could be the beginning of further conversations about demographics and inclusion um, in the workforce, particularly around safety and that psychological um, safety. Uh, so just sort of reflecting back, we've had some really thought pro provoking conversations and presentations. We had Jerome Carslake, uh, who managed to navigate through despite the technical challenges, uh, talking about Osroad's uh, suicide prevention project. We had Bronwyn Otto discussing some of the work being done around identifying and managing psychosocial hazards, uh, particularly around how that relates to uh, musculoskeletal and mental health disorders. And Chris Wilkes gave a really interesting showcase of Lynn Fox's 4Ds approach to practice-based safety discussions. I'm actually really blown away by the power of just asking those four simple questions. What's dumb, difficult, dangerous, and different about the work that we, um, that we do or the work as it's done? Um, and particularly when it's done in a space of trusty, trust and psychological safety, uh, I can see how it can really have an impact. So I really hope that you've taken something of value away from today's forum. I know I've taken away lots. Uh, let us know in the chat what stood out for you. Uh, and a real huge thanks to everyone who presented and attended today. It's been a great event, uh, despite our technical challenges. Uh, just one reminder that the recording of the forum is going to be available on ComCare's Transport Network Forum webpage in the coming weeks. Uh, and we'll put the link into the um, chats now for a poll. We've also got a poll up there uh, to let us know what you'd like to see in future forums. Um, we obviously Continue, we intend to continue the transport forum. Uh, and the next one is being planned for May uh, 2024. Uh, and to make sure that we continue to meet your needs, we're keen to hear your feedback. Uh, so we've got both uh, a short pulse check uh, that you can uh, pop in there. Uh, we're keen to hear through that way, but also we've put up a QR code. Uh, and we'll put in the chat the link to the survey and we'll send that out as well. Um, it makes a real difference in being able to shape what we do as far as future forums. So please um, take a minute or two to um, pop in your feedback there. We'd really appreciate it. Um, thanks again for joining us. Have a great day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.